I mean, when you think about artificial intelligence, it is this, this nebulous term people use. And uh, it just means that we are trying to make machines uh, as smart as humans, right? right? Uh -huh. uh, think like humans. That was Satya Malik, who is a doctor of computer vision. And I'm still blown away that that's even a thing. But he and I have been friends for a while and I've always been impressed by his ability to take something so complex and so abstract and boil it down and show us how these things affect our everyday lives. So today, what we're gonna be looking at is a platform he specializes in called OpenCV, which is stands for Open Computer Vision. And it's a really popular platform for developing machine learning and AI type applications whether that be on a device or in the cloud. And we're going to go deep into that, maybe why you should learn it, how you can learn it, and even just how it works and how the different parts of computer vision function. So before we do that, of course, make sure to like, share, subscribe, leave us a review on the podcast platform of your choice so that everyone knows that this content needs to be heard and that you're getting a lot of value out of it. So here we go. Without further ado, Satya Malik. <music> For people that don't know you, though, what is your background? How did you become a, uh, you get your actual PhD in computer vision? I did. Right? Yeah. How, how did that happen? Like, how, it was, like, was that a thing? Like, where do you go to school for that? How does this work? Yeah, so basically I started by, way back in, you know, 2001. Actually, before 2001, I was an undergrad uh, around 1999 or so. Uh -huh. I was second year uh, in, in uh, undergrad, right? So mm -hmm. I stayed back in my... Uh, at my university for a summer project. I was not sure what, what project I would do. I just stayed back and I thought that I'll hang around and talk to professors, etc. And so I went to this uh, guy who was building some, you know, uh, robot and some with a, with a camera uh, attached to it. So I went to him and I said, you know, uh, I, uh, it looks like you're doing uh, image something processing. Cool. Yeah. yeah, something cool. And I called it image processing, right? I said, you're doing some image processing How dare stuff. you? That's oh, yeah, he was offended. <laughs> he was like, this is computer vision. Oh. And I said, oh. <laughs> and I said oh, oh, oh. so what Excuse is computer me. vision, right? <laughs> and he says that, look, image processing is uh, image in and image out. You have either made the image better, you know, mm -hmm. denoised it. You may have compressed the image, but it is essentially image in and image out, right? There is no information that you're getting out of the image. Mm -hmm. But in case of a computer vision, you get image in or video frames in mm -hmm. and information out, right? So that's mm -hmm. the difference between computer vision and image processing. So, the, so and computer vision is a, a field of artificial intelligence. It falls yep. kind of under the, the umbrella of that, right? Yeah. So, I mean, when you think about artificial intelligence, it is this, this nebulous term people use and uh, it just means that we are trying to make machines uh, as smart as humans, right? right? Uh -huh. uh, think like humans. Uh -huh. uh, so that is artificial intelligence, but doesn't tell you how you accomplish that, right? And there are several subfields of uh, artificial intelligence. For example, you have computer vision that deals with images and videos. And then you have speech recognition that right. deals with speech. You have natural language processing, which um, deals... Uh, Are those not the same thing? No. So Oh, interesting. NLP, okay. NLP for example, uh, is, you know, you take text-based uh, oh, things. Oh, got it. Got and it. Do, uh, this is how we create uh, fake news articles. Right. All you, completely algorithmically. Yeah, the or, GPT stuff, right? Those yeah. kind of things. Yeah. Um, and then you have speech, which is completely different fields. Now, what has happened recently, right, in the last five years or so, we also used to use different tools, like uh -huh. computer vision people would use completely se separate tools than uh, sound uh, people versus yeah. uh, speak, uh, you know, NLP. language people. Yeah. yeah. But now everything is converged, right? There are these tools like TensorFlow and PyTorch, which are general purpose uh, AI tools, so to say, frameworks. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, for example, my consulting company, we used to work only in vision. But recently, we got an opportunity to work on sound. Uh, you know, Interesting. when you're doing a conversation, when you're in a Zoom meeting, you could have your dog barking, and we would learn sounds like dog barking dogs. We would learn uh, keyboard typing yeah. and things like that. And we can denoise the audio, even though we had never worked on audio, <laughs> right? But we are familiar with the tool chain. We are, the techniques are very similar yeah. for audio versus computer vision, etc. So we were able to work on that project and we delivered a very nice so, denoising algorithm. So, so, so let's go back though. So, so you're yeah. going to school, yeah. you're in college, and you you don't know what you're going to do. Right. Like every college student. Right. Right. 
and you see a guy working on a project yeah. that you know you you fumble into it. Yeah. And then what? And then you follow him around? Yeah, like, yeah, how, yeah. What I happens was, next? Yeah, so, I mean, the idea that robots could see, right, yes. that you're making robots see, that was fascinating. And uh, that, you know, it's, when you're, when you're in your undergrad, you don't know anything. It's just what catches your imagination, mm -hmm. right? I had been to other seniors who were working on some VLSI CAD stuff. It didn't you know, spark that joy in yeah. me, right? Oh, I'm, oh, I would make this, you know, VLSI CAD circuit yeah, that would yeah. do such and such things. They were excited about it, but I was not. So this one was very interesting. Next year, I asked, asked a professor to help me, you know, with this computer vision. Uh, and I said that I want to build a robot uh, that could, uh, you know, navigate, etc. Yeah. The project was not very successful. I mean, we built something. Uh, yeah. But... Uh, that was enough for me to, you know, get accustomed with the field, mm -hmm. and I was able to apply. When I applied for grad school, um, I applied in computer vision. I it, gathered that, enough knowledge. That's amazing that there's a that you can get a degree yeah. in computer vision because yeah. this was 2000, you said, or 2001, yeah, so, right? I mean, it, you know, because I. I was, you know, I'm a, I'm a bit a bit younger, but I was so I was guys finishing high school around then, going into college, and as a data guy, which I didn't know I wanted to be a data guy, just like right. no one does. But but like there was no such thing as a data science degree. Right. There's no it didn't exist. So yeah. so where did you go to school that had a thing called computer vision? So the uh, the funny thing is that the professors were learning themselves, right? Okay. So it was an emerging field. Right? Yeah. The professors were learning. We were working together, um, but. In grad school, it was a mature field, but it mm -hmm. was a very research-oriented field, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so this was when in 2001, I came here for my PhD uh, at University of California, San Diego. Mm -hmm. uh, I had this very interesting encounter with... Uh, uh, so my PhD advisor was invited to this uh, small group of people who were invited by Intel Mm -hmm. uh, to give a talk on machine learning and life sciences. Mm -hmm. And he could not make it because he was busy. He said that, why don't you go and give the talk? I said, well, I'll give it, go and give the talk. Opportunity. Yeah. And, um, but what happened was that I landed in between these luminaries in the field. Right? <laughs> yeah, these <laughs> and brilliant. I, I, yeah, <laughs> these top people, right? Uh, so I just thought that I'm just going to absorb whatever I can. I gave my talk, you know. Uh, and then there was this very small group of people discussing, and there was this old man saying how computer vision has been a complete failure. Oh, <laughs> yes. yeah, great. And I was, I was very annoyed, uh, you know, because I was sure. a grad student, and I thought that I'm not going to get a job he, with all this negativity. personally attacking you at this point, right? Exactly. This is your identity, right? right. You're here, you're doing your thing, yeah, okay. And uh, so, at that time, in 2000, around 2000, there was this new library called OpenCV, Mm -hmm. that was released, open source by Intel. And I knew about this library, I had used the open library. Open computer vision. Open right. computer vision library, yeah. right? And the one thing that worked really well in that library was face detection, right? Mm -hmm. It was magical to see that you can take your webcam and just point it around and it would detect, it would put a bounding box around the face. Right, this is the that, thing we see, you know, whenever you want to impress somebody, you just do this, it's like, what is happening? It's yeah. the face thing, yeah. And this was real time, you know, this was happening at 30 frames a second. It was mind blowing at that time, yeah, right? Right. Um, it's still mind blowing, I'm telling you. Yeah. Like, uh, I did a video where I used, uh, actually, you know, a mutual friend of ours, Adam, yeah. um, who created this really popular facial recognition library. Right. I used that to then trigger an API to unlock my Tesla. Oh, see. So, so I, I had my laptop sitting in the car with a right. webcam pointed out of it. Right. And, and when I would walk up to it, I pointed my face at it. Yeah. It was trained to know me. Right. And it would unlock the car just through the API. And it's like, what is happening? This is magic, right? But it's really, especially in what you do, this yeah. is this is a, maybe a cute project for it, a college kid the, or something, yeah, right? Hello World kind yeah, of Yeah, exactly. That's <laughs> the most basic right. thing you can do. But, but literally people were just like, you're a genius. How did you do this? You know? Yeah. So, but that, at that time, uh, you know, it was very impressive. And I, I thought that, you know, you have to say something, you know, when yeah. you're a group of, you feel that if you don't say something, uh, they won't uh, respect you or something, yeah. right? So I was almost about to tell this old person uh, uh, that, you know, there is this library called OpenCV, yeah. uh, which where face detection now works in real time. So there is, we have a future, right? Yeah. Uh, things Here's have started working. 
And I just had the good fortune of looking at his name tag. His name was Gary Bradsky, the founder of OpenCV. <laughs> Open <TV. laughs> he wrote, he started that library at... Uh, so, so was he being um, facetious? Was he being coy? Was he kind of joking? No, he, he was not it? joking. There was, uh, there was a little bit of pessimism at that time yeah. about what computer vision... Uh, it did not live up to its expectation. Sure. Right? Okay. At that time, it was still very. We thought we could do everything by now, but yeah, it's not it's, working. You know, the hype had uh, settled yeah. down, and we were in this kind of oh, you know, we can do a, a few things, mm -hmm. but it's not as much as we had thought. Right. It's the the hype cycle. Have you seen this chart? Yes. It, it's the hype cycle of technology. Right. It's right. all woo. Like cryptocurrency is probably there right now at the very exactly. top, tippy top. And then it falls down, and then it has a slow, gradual climb. Even autonomous driving, if you think about it, right? Yeah. They were saying that by 2020, right? Uh, oh, we will have full autonomy, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, you can look up Elon's tweets. We, me and my buddies were just passing these around the other day. 2016, yeah. he tweeted that by the end of 2017, they would have a car that drove completely from L.A. to New York without a person intervening at all. Right. That and was... even companies like Lyft, <laughs> Lyft and others were saying, Uber and Lyft were saying, oh, we will have completely autonomous yeah. vehicles by 2020. Yeah. And now they have disbanded their computer vision. <laughs> it's just completely. Yeah. What happens when they disband that? Do all the computer vision experts... Oh, Google sucks them up. Okay. Google has 50% Google has of all AI engineers in this world. Whoa. 50%. No government, nobody comes even close. Wow. Right? So they suck up all the talent. Well, and, okay, and they make, okay, so, all right, so these are all great stories. So, yeah. so okay, so, so you have this meeting, you have this conversation with yeah. Gary. Well, then I stop, I don't, I, yeah. I, I, I see his name. You see and you say, never mind, I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> but it was a pretty depressing uh, at that time uh, that, oh, people, these really big guys, right? right? They're not very optimistic about uh, about this field, right? You know, but but is that is that a sign of genius in a way? Like, if you look at the people that have really changed our world in a yeah. lot of ways, they're all very kind of grumpy people. <laughs> exactly. You know, sitting around thinking nothing's ever going to work, and then right. all of a sudden, one little thing works. Yes. That they did, and they're still yeah. not happy about it. So uh, I don't know. No, but know. that moment did come. That moment came in computer vision uh, in the year tw uh, twenty twelve. Mm -hmm. Um, right, okay, so what happened in 2012? So actually, it starts in 2010. Uh -huh. So uh, there is this idea, right? So we had these data sets which were, you know, uh, let's say an object detection, uh, an object recognition data set would have 10 categories, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you have this... Animal, not animal, yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah, 10 of those, right, categories. Yeah. And that would be a big data set. In fact, uh, Caltech 101 had 101 uh, categories. <laughs> And that was considered groundbreaking, uh, right? Yeah, That's that was best, uh, that was best big. in class, right? Um, and so, uh, but the uh, there's uh, there's this uh, researcher. Her name is uh, Fei Fei Li. She decided that she was going to spend create a very massive data set, right? Uh, where and people were always saying that oh, if we had more data, this problem would be solved, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's like a cop out, right? Oh, you know, if we sure. had, you know. So she decided, and you know, uh, you have to, you have to understand her courage. She was a non-tenured faculty at Stanford, right? And everybody told her that, what are you going? I mean, data collection. You're just creating a large data set. What kind of project is that? Yeah. It, that's not research. You're not going to go anywhere with this, right? right? And you're not even going to get tenure. But she had the courage to pursue this, and she created a data set. Uh, she, her team, and you know there were uh, several others. Uh, it's called uh, ImageNet Visual Recognition Challenge. They mm -hmm. created this challenge where there were one thousand categories and one million, um, you know, images. Uh, images. Yeah, so, and they made it public that go do this public data set right? and see how good you can do. Yes, right. So, so you have to take every image yeah. out of a million. Yeah. And you have to label it as one so, of these one thousand categories. Yeah. So, million images were for training. Uh, and there were oh, another okay. test set which was not exposed to you. Right. That you go, okay. So this is the the heart of machine learning. Yeah. Right. So I want to hear the story, but then I want to get into explaining to my simple brain what machine learning is, because right. this is this is kind of the best example of it, right? Yeah. So uh, I mean, we talked about AI, right? Yeah. AI doesn't tell you how you're going to become as smart as a human. Right. Right. But uh, a subset of human. So they came up with rule-based system, right? right? 
uh, and they even memorize stuff. Like if you think about the initial uh, AI system that, be, uh, that beat Ga Gary Kasparov, it was not very smart. It was just too fast, right? It could make a lot of calculations. Right. Uh, and so it was not really smart. It was just trained on a lot of uh, a lot of data, but mm -hmm. it was just fast, right? Yeah, and, and, and when you're trying to teach a computer a game, yeah. uh, I was listening to someone talk about this with Neil deGrasse Tyson about game theory, and there is a, a factor of how many possible situations you can be in, and it's yeah. basically like the number of squares and then the number of pieces and then the types of pieces. Right. So you have something really simple like, say, tic-tac-toe, yeah. which has like a, a factor of seven right. or something that's very simple. Yeah. And then chess has something like 7,000 or, I don't know, 1,700. Yeah. And then you have Go, Go which is... has like seven million. Right. So that's why that was a big deal, right? Because, yeah, chess... Exactly. It's Yeah, right. So chess still has a, even as complex of a game as it is, has a finite, like like uh, a factorial that we can comprehend. Right. And then you get into something like Go and you're like, this is beyond something that a human can possibly comprehend. Right. Right. And, and in chess, the thing is that if a human, if you gave human this ability that, oh, you could think, you could think so many moves ahead, mm -hmm. then, you know, they would make the same moves. Right? Yes, yes. Uh, so it was relatively easy. In Go, the, it's so vast, right? that you, you just cannot make the, that calculation. Right. So you we go don't by think intuition. the computer even has enough power to do it. Right? Yes. And more importantly, you're thinking that it is the intuition of the person that is more important, right? How, right. how do you teach? Right. Um, so if you watch that documentary on Netflix, AlphaGo, right? Yeah. So uh, Lee Sudol was actually surprised that this move that the computer made was magical. Right, <laughs> it was it magical. Was intuitive. It was intuitive, and it played in. Su he said that there was beauty in this. Move, wow! Right, there was beauty in this move uh, that the computer made, and he was just. He had appreciation for this computer. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Gary Kasparov, when he lost the first time, uh, the computer made a mistake. Mm. Okay, and Gary Kasparov could not understand what. How could you know? He said that. He's, How could it make a mistake? Yeah, and he yeah. resigned or something like that, right? Uh, it was a glitch, uh, right? <laughs> it was not a, a, a out of the world. It move. wasn't a programming error. It was literally a. It was a. It was some kind of programming error oh, okay. in the sense that uh, the computer made a mistake. That was the wrong move to play. Okay. And Kasparov thought that oh, I I just cannot understand. Uh, the computer has calculated so far in advance. How could it? Uh, that yeah. I'm a, I'm unable to figure out why it would make this stupid move, okay. right? And he resigned. And the mental pressure, right? It was mm. building on him and things like that. But uh, that's how he lost. Uh, the yeah. <laughs> he resigned or he drew, I cannot remember yeah. exactly. But in the case of Lee Sudol, he actually thought that it was a beautiful move. Right, right. right. So, so that's, that's, that's how far they've come. Okay, yeah. but now go back to ImageNet. Yeah. We're creating ImageNet yeah. for the purpose of what? Well, we were... Uh, to, to call this bluff that, oh, if we had an, <laughs> enough data... Oh, uh, right. We were, we so, so, so was that really what it was? It was, well, it we was, don't believe data is the, the, it the was, solution, or we do think it's a solution? People thought that data was the solution, okay but it was also used, uh, used as a cop-out that, oh, if I had enough data, I would solve this problem, right? right? Sure. Uh, so to test that hypothesis, you had to test that hypothesis, right? right? So somebody had to put the time and energy to make uh, this data set. So 2020, uh, 2020, 2010, uh, this uh, data set was made available. And uh, you didn't even have to, you know, the competition was you had to be right. In, you have to make five predictions. Uh, let's say you're given an image. You make five predictions. And if your prediction is in the top five, uh, then you... Then yeah, it counts. You, it counts, yeah. right? So it was the top five. Uh, how, how tight were those predictions? You know, because if you can think of dog or cat... Yeah. That's one example. Yeah. But then you can think of uh, a bulldog versus a schnauzer or something. Yeah. Like, like there how, are a thousand categories, right? Was, uh, is that a lot of categories or not? Uh, at that time, it felt I, I like mean, a lot of categories. Like right, yeah, okay. The, uh, yeah, that's what I'm getting at. Yeah. Right. Like, like uh, for example, uh, dog, was, dog is actually the biggest category inside. Sure. Um, dog, cat, but then there were flowers and things like that also, uh -huh. right? So there are a lot of categories and very different kinds of objects also, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, now, uh, so you all only had to, you know, be right. You have to give five top predictions, five. top yeah. five. And that uh, was about 72% uh, 
-hmm. the, the, the best uh, algorithm got 72% right. accuracy. Uh, next year, 2011, it went up to 74%. You know, that's how science moves by right. uh, increments. little increments. Yes. The, uh, in 2012, the, uh, the, the team that came second, it was about 76%, mm -hmm. right? Which is, again... Uh, another incremental. Another, yeah. uh, but the team that came first was 85%. 85. 85%. It's like, so you, you know, went from 74 winning to 85. 85. How'd they do that? So they came up with this. Uh, they already knew that this uh, class of algorithms called deep learning, mm. right, uh, was very powerful, but it was also very data hungry, right? Mm. So there are three things that happened. Uh, first of all, they used a GPU to run this. Deep learning is very computationally expensive. Graphics also. processing yes. unit, yeah. So the, the ones that you use for your games, right? right? Uh, so in early 2000, they had figured out uh, uh, that, oh, we have this massive parallel processor, right? And in a lot of these algorithms, we only need a multiplication and an addition that mm. is d done to every pixel, let's say. I'm yeah. roughly speaking, sure. right? So why don't we process all the pixels in the same, in the, in the same shot instead of going sequentially in, uh, in a CPU, CPU right? right? So they used a GPU to actually implement this uh, deep learning algorithm, right? And before that, deep learning was considered, you know, uncool. It was neural networks that were uh, 1960s technology, wow. right? And the word deep comes from the fact that it had more hidden layers. So usually there is an input layer mm -hmm. uh, where you put the image, and there's an output layer, with, which is the class label, let's say dog, cat, et cetera, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And in between, there are different layers. Uh, you know, one layer could be, um, it's an abstraction layer. You take this input, uh, put it through some level of abstraction, and then output, mm -hmm. right? So people knew how to train uh, when there is only one layer. As you put more layers, uh, you know, the training did not quite work. Uh, the mm. math was, they did not get the math right. Mm -hmm. So by 2012, they could make deep neural networks, right? So they could have more than one hidden. So you place. had you had now a data set with a million images, yeah, and GPUs, computational, so, yes. so large data set, yeah, huge computational power uh -huh. and algorithmic improvements. Those were the three things that came together uh -huh. and created this uh, massive leap forward. Massive leap right. forward. And now, now for contrast, what is a human score? If you sent me 95%. those images, ninety-five. Yeah. And where, that was 2012, so it's yeah. a while ago. Where are we today if we did that same uh, test? It's more than 97%. No, actually, I don't even know. The, uh, let me tell you the story. Okay, yeah, okay. let me hear it. So, so this was like, uh, you know, people fell off their chair when they uh, right. did this. In fact, uh, I used deep learning for a project uh, in 2014 for the first time. And when I saw the accuracy level, it was for a consulting project. I had used it for the first time. And I actually did not believe the results. <laughs> yes, I told my client there's Something's that, wrong here. I broke, the code's not right. Yeah, there's something wrong. I don't know what I'm doing, right? There's something wrong I'm doing. Can I have an extra day to give you the results, right? Mm -hmm. So I took an extra day just to show them the results because it looked, I was getting some 95, 96% accuracy. There's no way. Yeah. yeah, and that I had never seen in my uh, in my life, right? <laughs> that kind of thing. So it was magical for people, right? So 2013, uh, their, so deep learning, it was only in 2012, their Jeffrey Hinton's group had the only algorithm, uh, you know, that used deep learning. All other entries were other classical computer vision algorithms. Mm -hmm. In 2013, all winning entries were deep learning based. Wow, so that was it. Yes. That was it. So Jeffrey Hinton. Hinton. Yeah. I mean, they they now now when we talk about machine learning today, yeah. do we basically mean deep learning? Yes. Okay. Because Largely. Yeah. So 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 break it down for me. So what is machine learning when and and, and, and I mean I, I want to hear your definition as someone that is fully immersed in the space that, that yeah. knows the real answer. Right. But like, how does that real answer contrast with what we talk about it, generally speaking? Right. Right. I hear people say, "Oh, my Excel spreadsheet machine learning thing." 
Right. And I'm going, what are you talking about? That makes no sense. So what is machine learning in general? And give me some insights as to, you know, Right. The reality so if, of you, it. if you think of how, about AI as, you know, think about, uh, you know, Venn diagram or a chart, right? You have AI, which is this, anything that you produce, any algorithm that looks like, that is smart, you can call it AI. Okay. Right? Now, uh, people started by putting rule-based systems, right? You would encode all the rules mm -hmm. that if you do this, I'm going to do that. If, if this, then that. Yeah. If So that is also AI, you could say, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, but then people figured out that that's very cumbersome and it's uh, very difficult. So if you use data to make the inference, right, if you are using data, that's called machine learning, mm -hmm. right? So solving an AI problem using data by learning from data, from experience, learning from experience rather than somebody, a human expert coming in and encoding the rules. Interesting. So, so to me, in the data science world, yeah. we've done this forever, yeah. but we're generally trying to predict, say, sales numbers. Right. So, but we'll look at historical, you know, trends of, in all the variables you can think of, seasonality, yeah. products, whatever, right. marketing spend, those kind of things. Right. Would you call that machine learning? Doing a prediction on a number? As long as you're using data, you would call that machine really? learning. Really? Okay. Yeah. You would okay. call that machine learning. So, okay, I'll put that on my resume. Okay, cool. <laughs> Keep going. Keep going. Right. <laughs> I like this. Uh, but let's say you did not use past, uh, but you know that, oh, when I put a deadline in my core sales, <laughs> the sales, uh, you know, on that right. deadline day, you get the most sales, right? right? You know from that from experience, right? You just encode That's that. That's human oh. learning, not machine learning. Exactly. Yeah. So in your algorithm, you say that on, uh, on the last day, I'm going to get 40% of the sales, right? You mm -hmm. just encoded that. Um, it's still, you know, expert knowledge, but you did not learn it from getting uh, thousand course creators to come in and give that data or what were your sales numbers, right? So, so is that, okay, so then, so the machine learning, so machine learning is literally just some set of logic, yeah. even if I write if this then that, uh, No, it's you, usually using automatically data. derived from the data. Okay. Right, you're not telling the machine that, oh, uh, I want to encode this logic. Uh -huh. You just dump the data and out comes the result, right? That, and it could be using different uh, factors mm -hmm. in an intelligent way. You're not telling it explicitly that, oh, uh, I want to weigh this factor this way or that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's why you're, so uh, think about it this way that you have an objective function. You want to predict something, right? You know the ground truth, which means uh, from your data, mm -hmm. from, in your training data, you know uh, what you want to predict and you know the actual prediction. right? you write uh, something called a loss function, right? Mm -hmm. Which says, if the predictions, if your predictions are getting wrong, right? Then the loss uh, would be high. And your objective is to reduce the loss. Mm -hmm. So you encode something, you write some kind of machine learning algorithm whose job is to reduce the loss on the training set, right? Mm -hmm. And in a perfect case, your loss on the training set would go to zero, mm -hmm. yeah. right? And it would be, it would also generalize which means mm. that if you get new data, which it had not seen, the loss would also be similar to... Uh... Now, so so that's that's brilliant. And and it's it's so interesting how I've never thought of like what we used to call in the analytics space data mining yeah. as machine learning, but it's right. very much that case of... It is very much. Yeah, so, so then, um, okay, so that's a general definition of machine learning. Machine learning. So give me down, like, like if you're talking to other... Yeah. machine learning experts or computer vision people, what do you consider machine Is it that same thing or is there more to it than that? No, it, it, is, it is about that, right? Okay. Whenever we use data and we are training, we are optimizing a system so that it learns from data um, and you're trying to minimize the loss function mm -hmm. to, uh, you so, know, you have so an then when, function. So then when new data comes in, yeah. whether that be an image yeah. or a video, meaning lots of images yeah. sequentially, or sales numbers yeah. or you know staffing levels or whatever whatever the, the new data is that algorithm yeah. that by algorithm we mean a set of logic yeah. that has some output is going to be accurate we're trying to predict something whether it's right. is this a dog or a cat or are we going to have a good sales month or a bad sales month exactly. it's all generally machine learning it's all generally right? machine learning and your hope is that what you have learned from the training set generalizes to yeah. the test set to unseen data, yeah. right? Yeah. Because you can always create a machine learning algorithm <laughs> that's, perfect. that's zero error <laughs> on the training set, right? 
but that doesn't mean that it has learned the underlying truth. Right. right. So that's the challenge. So okay. So then um, I've Deep heard. Learning. Well, I've heard supervised and unsupervised. Yeah. What we're talking about here would be supervised. Which one? Supervised, because yeah. we gave it a training set. We gave it a training set. We gave it the input and the expected output. Okay, and right. it That's used the that. Training set. So, so we're looking at it, saying, "Hey, here's your answer. Yeah. Make the algorithm give me answers like this." Right. What would unsupervised learning be? Unsupervised learning is a class of algorithms where you're trying to find patterns in the data. Uh -huh. Right. For example, uh, the classical uh, problem in unsupervised learning is clustering. Right. Mm -hmm. So you find clusters in your data, mm -hmm. and you say you try to figure out that oh, what is this cluster, right? Mm -hmm. For example, uh, you could uh, uh, you could find uh, let's say um, let's say you have a data of uh, uh, housing prices, sure, right? Yeah, and you did not know anything about it. You basically put in all the data. Right inside it, which would have information about how many rooms are there, what's the you know square footage, square footage, yeah. etc. Does it have a right? pool, whatever. Yeah, and then you may find clusters that oh people uh, houses that have more uh, uh, that have more uh, rooms are also more expensive, mm -hmm. right? So you find clusters like this. So that is unsupervised where you. Where it, you don't it created hey this house is similar to this house. I don't actually know why. Yes. But they have attributes yeah. that that appear to show a pattern, right? And you did not label the data, right? You don't mm -hmm. you don't know what you want to predict. You are looking for uh, patterns in the right. data, right? And 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 so what? So is that used in computer vision much or not really? It is. It is very difficult to. Uh, I mean, of course, there are uh, clustering algorithms like k-means, etc. You want to uh -huh. find color clusters, etc. You use that uh, all the time, but it's uh, more. Uh, it requires a lot of data if you mm -hmm. want to solve uh, general purpose things with it. Mm -hmm. And you're much better off spending the time doing supervised learning, mm -hmm. right? To where you have an intention. Where you have an intention yeah. for a lot of problems. Right? Yeah. Um, but if you talk about, you know, the top people in the field, they are all working on <laughs> unsupervised. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, I, to me, you know, I used to work at Facebook. Yeah. And so to me, it, this sounds like a good thing for Facebook to see, oh, these people are all friends. Right. Where it's a relatively unsupervised thing, but I I looked at the images that yeah. they uploaded and I noticed they now now I guess would that be I, I guess that would be more unsupervised or not? Yes. Yeah, so whenever uh, whenever you can take raw data mm -hmm. right and uh, come up with patterns that is unsupervised. Right. In fact, yeah, I didn't say in, go find friends. I said yeah. look at all these images and, yeah. and cluster them. Yeah. And it's like well a lot of the same people's faces appear in the same images, so right. this must be a group of friends, right. or some association between them. We don't know friends, yeah. but yeah. So, uh, but if you want to so solve a specific problem, just solve the specific problem, <laughs> right? So uh, that's my take on it, right? Yeah. Don't use a bigger hammer than necessary to solve uh, your problem. Mm -hmm. In a lot of cases, you can create, uh, there are a lot of problems in computer vision uh, and machine learning where it is, Perfectly feasible to create, uh, you know, supervised data set right. for your application. Yeah. Well, one thing about that. So I'm curious your thoughts on this. Um, you know, <laughs> it's something I hear in the media a lot. Is oh, machine learning has bias because humans wrote the code. Yeah. Um, a case where I've where I believe that may be true unintentionally is housing prices. Yes. Where housing prices for poor communities, which are usually communities of color. Yeah. The the algorithm, correct me if I'm wrong, is not necessarily being biased against them. It's that in the real world, the pricing yeah. was biased against them, and then right. that is finding its way into the current home valuations. Yes. So so how do you think about? I don't know if you bias is the right word or ethics in yeah. these kinds of algorithms. I mean, because you know if we're trying to classify dogs and cats, that's one thing. But if yeah. we're trying to tell someone this is how much your house is worth, right. that has a serious financial impact on their life. Right. You know what I mean? So yeah. it's it's much more damaging than just tagging someone in a Facebook photo or something like that. Right. So how do you think about, say, ethics or bias in machine learning or AI as a whole? Right. So first of all, I, I need to uh, clarify that I'm not an expert in AI ethics. That's a, I just want your opinion on yes. it, you know, because yes. as someone that knows this far better than I do, I'm not asking you to be the uh, right, right. the authority on it, but I know you, you know, just what are your thoughts on it as so, someone that knows uh, it better? There is... Uh, there is a certain kind of algorithmic bias which is completely data dependent, right? Mm -hmm. For example, when they collected uh, face uh, detection data sets, 
they were uh, those data sets were predominantly white people, mm -hmm. right? Which in turn meant that uh, it didn't do very well on face detection, face recognition, etc. It did not do uh, well on people with color, mm -hmm. right? In fact, uh, we collected a lot of, uh, we had to retrain a lot of uh, uh, our face, even simple things like face detection and recognition, we had to retrain uh, based on people for this Indian market. We had created uh, this thing for the Indian market. Your company did this? Yes. Yeah. Uh, and uh, we had to collect data for Indian, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, there could be other biases like, uh, you know, uh, a common kind of data set is you take celebrity pictures, so you suddenly have good-looking people yeah, <laughs> right, right, in your right. data. Yeah. Uh, so, so those kinds of, that's very obvious, right? Uh, and those things need to be fixed. And it's really good that people are highlighting that this. Uh, but it, how do you? What is the answer? How do you fix it? Was well, is there, this is one there is an easy one to fix? No, but, I know, but I yeah. mean, is there generally speaking? Yeah. So, so, so what I'm hearing is when the data is biased, yeah. the algorithm is going to continue that bias. Yeah. Right. Yeah. When when all your facial recognition stuff is on white people, yeah. and you show it a non-white person, yeah. it's not going to recognize them. Right. Not because it's prejudice against non-white people, but because yeah. it just doesn't have the data to right. so recognize, like it's, so, but it carries it forward. So how do you, you know, well, what do you do? That one is easy to fix, right? You, you just give it other faces. Yeah, you yeah. add more faces from different parts of the world, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, now it starts working equally well on all, uh, sure. pretty much everybody, right? Yeah. Like I was talking before this meeting that these machine learning models, they have such huge capacity mm -hmm. that you can add a lot of data and it will keep learning. In fact, mm -hmm. we have to make sure that they don't memorize. <laughs> they have such <laughs> huge capacity to learn that we have to make sure that they don't memorize the answers, right? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, okay, so that problem is relatively easy to fix once you have identified that there is a sure. data problem. But then there is a correlation problem, right? Where uh, certain things are correlated uh, like you said, housing prices, right? Mm -hmm. There is a correlation between housing prices and, let's say, uh, uh, people of color mm -hmm. living in th those neighborhoods, right, right? Right. Those are extremely difficult uh, to to solve, mm -hmm. right? Because it's a correlation problem, and uh, uh, I mean, <laughs> what do you do about that? Well, right? and, and and it's, I mean, it's to me, it sounds very similar, though. The data it gets, yeah says this is how much, you know, here's historically how it's been worth. Right. But the reason it's lower yep. is because of old racist policies that forced it to be lower, yes. right? So it's yes. it's a, one of those things where it was, it's a continuation of that. I mean, so I guess, can it be undone? Or is it as a person developing these algorithms, whomever you are at whatever company, yep. you can't just blindly make them anymore. You have to think... You have to think very carefully about the consequences of how you are constructing the data set, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, for very large data sets, so this is one of the uh, the people who work in AI ethics. The things that they are really, you know, uh, they bring out this concern that you're looking at these very large uh, data sets and you're trying to automate the system as much the data generation process. You're trying to automate as much as possible. Let's say. For example, uh, all the text, you know, the GPT model, mm -hmm. it's so good because it's been trained on billions of, uh, you know, yeah, the articles. Whole articles. Yeah, so this is the thing you can use to generate articles, text. text. Yeah. yeah. And there's actually some really cool tools out there that'll. Conversion. Yeah, conversion.ai. Yeah, 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 super cool. Yeah. And I think Elon was left a company, OpenAI, open AI because yeah. it was too good. Well, that's what he claims, right? Well, he, well, says yeah. that. <laughs> he says he let's says not, let's not assume we know Elon's intentions right. about anything, right. right? But that was his. Yeah, so he says that uh, it's so dangerous that yeah. uh, that uh, we cannot release the actual model, so we will reduce. Uh, we will actually release a model that is less capable, uh -huh. right? And I think uh, the same model was then licensed yeah, to yeah, Microsoft whatever. <laughs> or somebody, right? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, so but. If you look at that data set, it has not been verified by humans, mm -hmm. right? It has not gone through this. So everything has been automated, right? You get all this data, which means that if there is a bias in language, right? Yeah. It will carry forward. Right. right? It is just because, I mean, if you look at historical uh, uh, text, right, there could be a lot of racism there, right? Yeah. Because yeah, at of course. that time, it was 
Before. Well, if, if you look at um, if you look at housing, uh, pol- not not policies, but well, yeah, in the U.S. specifically, there are old. Um, if you look at a lot of houses that are older in the U.S., there are uh, were a part of the deed. Even there were rules yeah. that these certain houses in certain communities could not ever be occupied or sold to people of color. Yes. And obviously the words I'm using are much more polite than the words that were in there. Yes. So if you have an algorithm that ingests the rules for housing yeah. and it reads all of this, yeah. it could it would be very it would be understandable that it would spit out like, hey, let me let me have it draft up rules for me selling my house. Right. It could have rules like that built in right. because a person never sat there and said, exactly. No, that's wrong. We shouldn't do that. Right. Right. Yeah. So yeah, and uh, that that is uh, you know uh, major problem. Right. That's a major problem. So what they're saying is that uh, this large data sets are a menace to uh, which have not been super, you know carefully uh, verified by humans. They can create a lot of harm. Yeah. Right? So what they are saying is that you have to have a data policy where any new data that comes in has gone through this review process. And we know exactly what's being used to train these systems. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, uh, and I, I agree with that. It's approach. garbage in, garbage out, right? You get yeah. bad data coming in, you're going to get bad results, yeah. no matter how smart the system is. Right. And, and and by they, we're talking about Google because they have 50% of all people yeah. <laughs> and they have right. all the world's data, right? Right. Okay, so, so let's get back to, sounds great. Thank you for that. I, I want to know, okay, so in 2013, every model for the ImageNet competition was deep learning. This yes. was the birth of deep learning. It was a revolution, right. you know. It and was Jeffrey Hinton. So there are three. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton, Jan Lucken, Joshua Bengio. They all won uh, the Turing Prize. You know. Really? Like, yes. yes. That's fantastic. Uh, so, so they were the pioneers, the forefathers. Well, yeah. maybe that's a wrong. Uh, the, the yeah, the, the founders of. Deep learning, they, really? They're called the deep. Le- they call themselves the deep learning mafia. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How was that? Okay, fine. Yeah. Hey, if you've done that, and you, you know, you're allowed to call yourself whatever you want. No, fine. Uh, yes, but the thing is that you would be surprised. I would skip neural network papers uh, in 2015 as a grad student. I would look at neural network. Not interested. I would skip those papers because it's not deep learning. At this no, point, no, 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 no. Oh. Th- those were deep learning papers. Okay. Those were being written by the, uh, you know, these... The uh, mafia, peop- yeah. Yeah, the mafia. It was just uncool. And oh, I did wow. not think. And, okay, here's the thing. Uh, back in... Two th- not in 2015, I misspoke. Uh, I, I meant 2005. Oh, okay. So before... Yeah. So those guys, before ImageNet, deep learning had been... Existed. It was a concept. Deep learning existed. It did not outperform... Uh, Got it. And... The existing techniques, they were mathematically beautiful. Sure. Right? Um, the only thing is that if you look at the curve of performance, uh, deep learning techniques, they don't saturate. Right? The more data you get, mm-hmm. give it, it keeps learning and keeps getting better. Other techniques, they saturate. Mm. Right? Uh, after a while, they don't What does have, that mean, saturate? So the performance doesn't improve with additional data. Right. Okay. So there's kind of like uh, like an S curve. It it, it trails it plateaus, off, right? Diminishing yeah. returns. Yeah. yeah. It just doesn't improve uh, if you give it uh, more and more data because they don't have the capacity to uh, ingest that much data. Mm-hmm. Right. The models did not have the capacity, but they were beautiful in the sense that oh, you clearly you could see what was going on very yeah. clearly. In deep learning, it was considered very messy. Mm. Right. Uh, it's also it's very engineering and mm-hmm. less. Uh, less, you know, mathematically satisfying. <laughs> it's literally high school math. Uh, yeah. That is, uh, but it's, it's over and over and over again with all yeah. the different layers, right? Yeah. So it's, the math is very simple. And after that, it's, it's engineering, right? A lot of... Implementing oh, they would say, it, right? Yeah, they would say that, oh, we tried this uh, activation function and it works uh, very well, right? And you would say, um, why? You know, you, you don't have that satisfying answer yeah. as compared to, let's say, uh, support vector machine, etc. when we had very satisfying answers, the mathematics mm-hmm. was uh, nice and cool, etc. This one was very messy, right? Mm. Uh, so, But the thing is that why would you use a messy function when it doesn't uh, outperform, right? It was just as good as classical. So at the time, 2005, when yeah. you're reading these and you're seeing this deep learning stuff, yeah. are you thinking... What are you guys doing? Exactly. You're thinking it's not uh, satisfying to work on, yeah. which I think is something we all 
want in our work is yeah. the fulfillment of, of the work itself. Yeah. And you're not getting better results. And it's computationally expensive. And it's, it's, it's insanely hard from an yeah. engineering standpoint. Right. Uh, so, so what was it? That, what did they see that we didn't see? You know? Was were, it the potential? Like, oh, if we just make computers 100x better, this would be much better. Right. So, what, was, what was the foresight there? Uh, they had this conviction, right? They had this conviction that this is the right technique. Yeah. It was partially motivated by the human uh, visual system that, uh -huh. um, and the fact that the, the model did have the capacity to learn. Uh -huh. right? um, so th I think those were the main things that they were completely committed that you can actually train something uh, like this, uh, which, which would have a huge capacity to learn, and mm -hmm. so it will get better with data. And it's one of those instinct, instincts, right? Yeah. People develop while working in the field for a long time. Yeah. And these three people pushed hard on that. In fact, uh, Jan Lucken created uh, the, one of the few successes they had was with this hand, uh, handwriting recognition. Mm. So U.S. Postal System, I believe U.S. Postal System used one of the systems developed by Jan Lucken to, uh, to, uh, to detect uh, this um, Address zip code. Oh, Actually, zip code. just the zip code. <laughs> <laughs> uh, accurately. Yeah. Right? Not the whole thing. Just I think it was just the but zip even code. even that, I mean, people's handwriting is terrible, so yeah. that's a feat of itself. Yeah. So it was a big deal uh, back then, and that was considered one of the main uh, achievements of deep learning. Mm. And then people would say that, oh, that's good, but then, you know, there's... Uh, what else? Yeah. What else, it's right? kind of minimal, yeah. So... After 2012, these guys have become uh, rock stars. Yeah, right. Uh, right. They, they won the Turing. Books and tours and speaking engagements. and. Well, this guy, uh, Jan Lucken, uh, is uh, uh, the uh, head of uh, uh, Facebook research. Oh, is yeah, he? Yeah. Nice, yeah. Uh, Jeffrey Hinton, he's at Google or... Um, and then uh, Yeshua Bengio, he doesn't want to be associated with companies, so he's at a university, right? Yeah, right. But they won the Turing Prize, and they got the recognition so then, they deserve. So then it's off to the races. Now we're going to do deep learning on everything. Or yes. what happens next? What happens next is 2015, there were three uh, teams that beat uh, human uh, visual systems. Wow. Right? Better than 95%. One was, I think, Google, Microsoft, and... Um, and Baidu. I oh, think. yeah. Baidu's, uh, you know, they, they did a little bit of cheating. <laughs> and so they were disqualified. But still, you know, it was not... Impressive uh, still. It was impressive yeah. uh, that three teams beat. And, and by that, you said above 95%? Yeah. Yeah. So that means that if you showed me five images, yeah. that, the, that I would guess... Well, it depends. I mean, depending on what the images are, I may or may not. But it would be as good as I am. And, and yeah. I think, you know, is this basically... To bring this home to somebody that doesn't have a clue what we're talking about, if I, it, with on my Android phone or even on an iPhone with Google Photos yeah. or Google Camera, I can point it at a thing, yeah. like, a, a, like a plant, right. and it can tell me exactly what plant it is. Right. It doesn't always work, yeah. but it's far better than I am yes. unless I happen to be an arborist or an expert in that thing. Right. Well, in this case, the person actually, when they compared human visual, the, the person actually spent a few hours learning uh, the various categories. Oh, really? Right. So they, they even had prep. They, yeah, it they wasn't had just, here's a bunch of images. No, 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 no. They had yeah. prep. Uh, and they still didn't do as good. They did not do as good wow. because uh, there was, you know, a cat can look like a dog sometimes. Sure. Right? And they had different breeds of dogs, right? So different breeds can look very similar sometimes, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So it's, it's not very easy for humans to, even if you have the training, right, um, and then there is fine-grained visual recognition challenges also where, you know, two breeds uh, of birds may look very similar to each other. Mm -hmm. The computer can th tell them apart, but the humans uh, have a very tough time. This, so, so again, our, our mutual friend Adam um, Getchy, I think is how you say yeah. his last name, uh, had a funny blog post on this. Did you see it where you had Will Ferrell and Chad Smith, the drummer from Red Hot Chili <laughs> okay. Peppers? I see. They, <laughs> they look identical. Right. And there's even a funny thing where they go on Jimmy Kimmel and they do a drum off. Again, they're wearing the same clothes and everything. Right. And he used that as his example where for facial recognition, yeah. it was very easy for yeah. it to determine. Right. You know, but a human looking at it, because we know distinctly who these people are because they're celebrities, right. we can tell. But it is striking how similar they are that it's kind of surprising that the computer right. w gets it right. In fact, uh, Yoshua Bengio, you know, mm -hmm. one of the, uh, his brother... 
Uh, his name is Sami Benjio. Mm -hmm. And I think they are twins. Oh, wow. They look identical. They both learn, uh, work in machine learning. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so it's, it's, a, you know, it's a very funny thing. Uh, you can't tell them apart, yeah, right? It's, it's hard to tell them apart. So, so we're off to the races. Deep learning is taking over the world. It's now, even to this point today, very that, prevalent that, in our lives. Or? Yes, and, and uh, that uh, challenge, by the way, it has modified. They did not, they stopped. That yeah. This is getting ridiculous now. 99% <laughs> right? or something, right. yeah. So now uh, they stopped that challenge, but they have, now there are other competitions, right? Mm -hmm. uh, where it's, you know, fine-grained visual recognition. It's harder and harder. Then which can, breed, which animal or yeah. whatever, yeah. And then initially it was an image classification problem, right? Mm -hmm. They, uh, you had an image, and for the entire image you would, output a single tag, mm -hmm. right? Whether this is a dog. Yep. But then there are other problems in computer vision. Uh, so it's about the granularity of information, mm. right? Uh, image classification is this problem. Then you have object detection, mm -hmm. where you say that, oh, it is a dog, and look, it is inside this bounding box. Yep. So that's object detection. Mm -hmm. So deep learning was, it's, it was an obvious next step that uh, you know it would be applied to, uh, this also. Mm -hmm. And then all the object detection <laughs> algorithms <laughs> so, all uh, deep are all deep learning based mm -hmm. now, right? Then there is even a higher level of granularity where you want to say that, oh, I want to, uh, this is a dog, but this is the outline. These are all the pixels mm. that belong to the dog, right? Mm -hmm. Not just a bounding box, right? But the exact pixels, the outline of the dog, mm -hmm. right? And that is called image segmentation. Okay. And very soon, uh, you know, this is this is happening by 2015 already. Um, yeah. All the, all the, uh, you know, <laughs> these algorithms, deep learning is basically taking over. Mm -hmm. And the reason is that the visual cues that deep learning, the neural network was learning, it is the same visual cues that help it to do image classification, object detection, segmentation, mm -hmm, etc. Mm -hmm. It has learned something fundamental about the image, mm -hmm. right? So uh, now. Image segmentation, also, you know, the, all the state-of-the-art algorithms are uh, deep learning based. Yeah. Then there is something called pose estimation, where you find key, point, key points okay. on the person, right? Okay. You might have seen these, uh, uh, you know, demos where you have a person walking and a skeleton of the person oh, yeah. is overlaid. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so it, is that where gate detection comes from? Is that a part of that? Gate estimation. For To, to do gate estimation, you need to first... Uh, get the skeleton. I, I've noticed this, uh, and I want to keep going on all the different parts of computer vision because I think that's a key lesson. Um, but I've noticed this with Google Photos, which is an absolutely incredible app, yep. and it uses a lot of this stuff you're talking about, yep. where I can search for, you know, like uh, my photos of my kids or my wife, and it will show photos that they're in where they're not looking at the camera. Yeah. They're off in the back. There was, there was sometimes it showed up where... I, I would search for a picture of my wife, and, and I'm like, why is it showing me this photo? And it turned out she was in the reflection of a piece of glass. Right. Like, imagine a picture of someone in the car, yeah. and there's a window here, and she's in there, and she's not even looking at the camera. And I'm going, uh, like, incredible. if you had shown me that yeah. image, and I was picking one she's in, I would have totally missed it. Right. And so, also, the age, how uh, kids progress. Yes. Uh, that's incredible that they are able to find uh, my son <laughs> in his birth picture. Because <laughs> as a baby, as and babies, a baby. Don't, they don't look like anything like no, they do but now. but they have trained continuously as you kept adding more and more images. Yeah, so they, it's going to really know. They have the flow, yeah. So, okay, so you have object detection, yeah. image recognition, image segmentation, and then the Pose key, estimation. Pose estimation, yeah. okay. Uh, that, that's basically key point detection. Right. It's right. also called uh, pose estimation. Okay. And there are several such problems, right? Okay. Where deep learning basically has taken over as the state of the art. But even with, let's say you just learn uh, image recognition, object detection, and um, uh, image segmentation. Mm -hmm. That is like 80% of our consulting work. Really? Yes. So, so what other areas are there besides those four we laid out? Are there other kind of general broad categories in, uh, in computer vision that people should yeah, so learn? Or, I mean, it sounds like the, the, those three there are the big ones. Those three are uh, computer vision related to... Uh, so computer vision and machine learning have this overlap, right? right? Uh, that a lot of computer vision problems can be solved using machine learning. Mm -hmm. But there are many other computer vision problems that uh, may not require uh, machine learning at all. For mm -hmm. example, 
if you want to build panoramas, you could just take uh, pictures yes. and stitch the images together. That's still computer vision. Okay. But it is not. Um, uh, but it doesn't. It's using the geometry of the scene, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. It is um, to to stitch the images together. Got it. It's not using machine learning. It doesn't need to know. Mm -hmm. It's not training. It can just analyze what the image has yeah. and connect the dots essentially between them. Exactly. So that's much more of a engineering problem, or how would you describe that? It's a computer vision problem. Yeah. Okay. But it is uh, again three D reconstruction, for example, mm -hmm. where you're taking two cameras and generating a three D model of the scene. Yeah. Right. Stereo camera. Right. That's also computer vision. And only recently, uh, that field has been invaded with <laughs> deep learning as well, right? Uh, and you can imagine why, right? The yeah. reason is that um, even with a single image, right, I can, I can predict, you know, I, I'm looking at that camera, uh, I can predict to some uh, amount of accuracy that, oh, uh, it's about this, this far away, mm -hmm. right? Or at least this camera is in front of the monitor, yeah. right? So I can say even with a single image, Right. Uh -huh. So if you train your now, now how, how how can you though? Because like we as humans yeah. have two eyes. No, and, even and with that's... close your eye, close uh -huh. your eye, you can uh -huh. still see. It's... Right. I can see that it is in front of it in terms of I can see the full frame of it. Yeah. Whereas if it were behind it, the the monitor would appear to be in front of it to yeah. some yes. part. But that can be tricky, right? Because there are be all tricky. kinds of optical ways where that wouldn't be true. Yes. Right. And that's where deep learning will also fail, right? Okay. Um, so there are a lot of single image based uh, single image based depth estimations. They assume that you're not trying to trick the system. Right? <laughs> it is a regular sure? scene, which uh, it's a similar kind of scene it was trained on, right? Mm -hmm. And therefore you are able to say uh, that okay, uh, there is uh, you know mm -hmm. uh, you're not trying to trick the system. But you can always create, for example, this camera, right? This camera could have been much farther away and much bigger. Yes. Right. Yes. And you would not know the difference. It's going to pr produce the exact same image. Right. Right. As. Uh, right. Uh, so so. So uh, we sitting here with our two eyes would say, that's fifty feet away or yes. that's twenty meters away. But with a single image. But you can't. here, but yeah, with with a, the computer vision would say that's you know one Even meter human away vision, or something. Right. If you take yeah. a picture of something, if you took a picture of a small oh, right. that car. Yeah. Right. If I zoomed in and I uh, removed, you know, I put it on a, uh, a road or road something, or something yeah. Right? yeah, you could you assume would, it would be full size. Yeah, you yep. can't tell, right? And that ambiguity is always there. Right, in but the let's image. But say, let's say uh, you, you say that you're not trying to trick the system, right? Uh, it's, uh, then, then you can, uh, you can, you can say, assume. Okay, uh, yeah, I've seen this Tesla before, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And Tesla is of this size and therefore uh, It must I be, yeah. yeah. Okay, so, so if I'm learning computer vision, yeah. we've talked about four main categories, uh, or uh, I don't know what you call them, uh, ways that you apply computer vision, yeah. right, image recognition and all that. If, if, I'm, if I'm new to it and I want to get into it, uh, would you say just focus on those three, object detection, image recognition, image segmentation? Uh, well, so before that, you need to learn uh, a class of techniques. Okay, right? hit me with it. Um, yeah, so there are, like I said that before d deep learning, we had uh, traditional computer vision techniques, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And part of it is machine learning, but there are other things that you need to learn. Uh, for example, I mean, just starting with what's an image, right? <laughs> you need to learn that. You need to learn about uh, color-based uh, analysis of the image. Mm -hmm. You want to do, suppose, color-based segmentation, mm -hmm. which you would think that, oh, uh, uh, when does that happen? It happens all the time where you have to extract just based on color, yeah. right? You're trying to make uh, some determination. Think about all the industrial applications, mm -hmm. right? Where uh, you have the ability to put markers and things like that. Yeah, right? it's yeah, a yeah, very yeah, yeah. controlled setup. So you can say if that red square is not red, yeah. something's wrong. Yeah, something right? like that. Yeah, right. I'm looking for red squares versus green squares. When I see the green square, I do this. Yeah, the robot does this. Yeah, if I see a red square, I do something else. Got it. Right. Uh, very so, easy, very yeah. uh, hard coded. I don't, I'm not doing machine yeah. learning here. I'm just writing code. Right now, now when I'm writing code, so if, I, if I'm getting into uh, computer vision, yeah. OpenCV is what I'm going to use. OpenCV is the first library you okay. need to learn. And you say library. What do you yeah. mean by library? What programming language am I in? What am I doing? So the uh, OpenCV library is written in C++. C++. But 
but okay. it has Python bindings. And okay. more than 50% of the people actually use the Python version of OpenCV. Okay, right? got it. So, so, so if I know Python yeah. already, mm -hmm. I'm in good shape. You're in good shape. Okay. Right. Now, I, I need to learn the other, uh, what do you say, principles of it, right? Yes, the principles of it. Uh, and OpenCV library, in the beginning, you know, it was the way it is designed, it, it, it was designed for researchers to be able to replicate, uh, have a common framework, right? So that you're not rewriting all the code from scratch, right? That mm -hmm. was the intent. Uh, so it's not the easiest library if you don't know the theory, right? Okay. For example, um, for example, if you want to do edge detection, right? Which would you, be like an image, like drawing an outline. Drawing an Is outline. Is this image segmentation? Uh, it is not segmentation. Okay. Because, um, it's uh, yeah. It's basically drawing an outline, contour okay. analysis, okay. if you want to call okay. it right. So you want to find different contours and edges in uh, in an image, uh, but if you don't know the algorithm, right, uh, you would be lost in OpenCV. Mm. You want to say that oh, you want to use the canny edge detector, mm. and then there are these parameters. If you don't know the parameters. Uh, like OpenCV documentation would say that, oh, this T1 is the first threshold and T2 is the second threshold of the hysteresis thresholding, yeah, right? Yeah, right. So, but if you, you don't know what that means, yeah, then so you, would, I can type the things in, yeah. but I, if I don't know what I'm typing, right. then I, I'm lost. Yeah, so that's, that's a challenge that you okay. have to know. Uh, so simple things like edge detection, mm -hmm. right? You need to know the algorithms behind it, even mm -hmm. if you don't know. So how do you learn that? Like, so, so if, I, if I'm really starting out here, yeah. Python would be good to learn. Python is just the, yeah. basics of Python. Right. Don't care about what what purpose of Python. Just right. how to fire up PyCharm or whatever, and just yeah. type things out. And then I go into the principles behind computer vision, which yeah. are these things we're talking about here. Is that just documents I'm reading, YouTube videos, your blog? I'm sure. Yes. Like, like where am I starting out? So, uh, I mean, uh, you asked this question, so I have sure. to shamelessly Please. plug my uh, our courses. So we, we, first of all, we have a free uh, three-hour course. Uh -huh. uh, it's a tutorial, long tutorial, uh, that you can free, uh, find at uh, Free uh, Code Camp. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same uh, material is also published with Anaconda. Anaconda is, you know... Uh, Python package Python or package. Python software. It's not an IDE, but it's like an instance of it, right? Yeah, so they have a Nucleus... Uh, they have a new program called Nucleus, mm. which is their learning platform. Oh, cool. And we just published uh, it on their platform as well. Okay. So you can find uh, that free crash course there, and it is completely free. Mm -hmm. So that will get you started, right? You will mm -hmm. understand uh, the basics, et cetera, and it's mm -hmm. only three hours, so you can, uh, you know, fit, you can do all your experiments in, in a day in a and day. see, uh, you know, how you like it, right? That's the main thing, mm -hmm. uh, whether it sparks joy. And what am I going to learn in there? What kind of things am I going to build or do? Uh, so you will learn, um, you will learn the basics, you know, how do you read an image? How do you display an image? How do you, uh, you know, write on an image? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so things like that. Then you will learn about uh, color uh, theory a little bit. Mm -hmm. You will see, I mean, simple things like HSV color transform, etc. You will mm -hmm. learn about that. But then we also jump into interesting stuff, right? Mm -hmm. Where you don't learn the theory at all, but you learn how to do face detection, for example. Right? Yep. Oh, two lines of code, this yep. is face detection, yep. and this is how the API works, even if you don't understand completely what's going under the hood, but you know that changing this parameter would change um, you know, such and such things. Right, yeah, you, you don't necessarily know that when you take an image, it's doing this thing where it like skews it, Mm -hmm. and puts all the eyes in the same place or something, like how actual face detection works, yeah. you just know, I fed it some data, yeah. I said, find the faces and tell me who they are or something, and it gave me an answer, right? Right, and yeah. that itself could be very powerful. Yeah. You know, when, for example, you're learning music, you don't need to learn about, uh, you know, the harmonics and, you know, the... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, how the Fourier transform or the Fourier uh, series works, right? Yeah, you, I just want to know how to play a song that I like. Yes, and I right? will tap this, and I get, oh, this sound, this is how it sounds, right? right? And gradually I build that intuition about music. And you can do the same thing with computer vision also. It won't make you an expert in computer vision, right. but it will get a lot of stuff and, and you'll get to know whether or not it's good for you, whether or not this is the path you're going to go down, right? That's so, okay. So, as, okay, so, so after I've... Okay, so so I know Python. Yeah. I've taken your free three-hour course. I've got the basics. Yeah. 
now I go on GitHub and like, what's the next step for me as someone that's so, trying to get, get like, let's say I want to get a job at Google doing computer vision. And I want to talk right. about TensorFlow and stuff like that too, yep. but that's the, let's start with just how do I get into this? How do I, you know, go further down the path? So we, uh, we actually are launching, um, uh, we just finished a Kickstarter campaign, mm -hmm. um, which was backed by about five, 1,522 people. Wow. Um, and we we raised about $238,000. Wow, congrats. Thank you. Uh, it is OpenSea for beginners. Well, right? okay. So okay. that's the perfect course. And that's a one-month course, you know, four, four, four or five weeks you will learn. And again, the emphasis is on creating more interesting things that you can do. Mm -hmm. And we don't go into in depth, uh, you know, into the deep algorithmic details about various things. Mm -hmm. So you learn enough the, so that you build an intuition about, uh, you know, how this thing works. Mm -hmm. For example, like the edge detection thing I was uh, talking about, right? We build a sim simple application where you can manipulate the various parameters and you can see, oh, this is how, uh, you know, this is what so the Learn by doing. Yeah. Learn by doing. and we will tell you what this parameter will do, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, so OpenCV for beginners, I think uh, if you, and it's a very inexpensive course. Right now, mm -hmm. we moved from Kickstarter to Indiegogo. Mm -hmm. Indiegogo has this uh, in-demand thing that if you have a successful Kickstarter campaign, oh. after the Kickstarter campaign <laughs> ends, bring it to our platform, sure. right? Uh, while you're, because there is a delay between when the product has been, uh, Kickstarter campaign ends, and when the product is actually available. Right. During that phase, you can just use Indiegogo. Um, okay. And we raise, obviously, we don't want to give it at the same price right, right, as the right. Kickstarter campaign, but it's still a very good price. Okay. Uh, you know, $67. Um, for, Great. Yeah. So, so I go through a month-long training here, yeah. and at the end of that, I am dangerous. Am I ready to get a job at Google or not no, yet? No, okay. No, no. Um, so I think, you know, people... Um, I would be lying if I said that, oh, with a month of experience, you would get a job at Google. Sure. Right? Uh, but let's say if you want to get, uh, Google is a different category. Okay, so I want to, okay, right? okay. Let's sure. say if you want to get a, a job at a decent company, let, let's say a startup, et cetera, right? That is still about a year of preparation, okay. right? A Got solid it. year of preparation where mm -hmm. you're spending your nights and weekends on this. And we have a series of courses. Oh, that, you can take me all the way there then? Yes. Wow, great. That, that I can say 100%. So we have three courses. Uh, so uh, OpenCV for Beginners is the first one. After that, we have three more courses. One is called Computer Vision 1. Mm -hmm. It is an introductory course in all uh, computer vision techniques, right? Many, many different things you will learn. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, that takes about three to four months. Okay, good. Um, so I'm, I'm really spending some time here. I'm invested. But yeah. by this point, I've been bitten by the bug of yes. wanting to do this. Yes. Right. Okay. And then uh, you have Computer Vision 2, which is an applications. Mm -hmm. uh, it exposes you to different applications. And there again, uh, in Computer Vision 1, we do go into theory a little bit. Mm -hmm. So you will get a very good understanding. Uh, you can skip the theory and still benefit from all the applications that uh, are in the course. But if you want to d uh, dive into the theory, we have that material as well. Sure. Um, in Computer Vision 2, which is about applications, we expose you to various applications. How do you deploy this uh, as a web application, right? Yeah. Uh, how do you do text recognition? You don't want to know. Text recognition is a classic example where if you want to dig dive, uh, dig deep into the theory, uh -huh. it's hard, right? It's You need to learn a lot of stuff. And, and by that, you're saying, I took a picture of something, yeah. and I want to read what is in the picture. That's right. Right. Yeah. Right. So that... Uh, I always thought that was something that would be so simple. You know? uh, that's actually, well, think about it this way, that the formatting of the document, et cetera, could be very different, Yeah. right? No, so I, you need yeah. to know that, oh, I have to end at this uh, level and then start reading. It's a yeah. two-column document, et cetera. Yeah, right? well, and then, well, I guess, so in, obviously, being from the Western world, we read in a certain direction and everything yeah. like that, but other parts of the world, it's not like that. Exactly. So, and then imagine, you know, Japanese or Chinese characters where it's like top to bottom, right to left, it's, right. you know, we're, we're, it's completely different, right? It's so, completely, Korean, we did a Korean OCR project uh, a while back uh, where they have like, if you do it naively, they have like 2,000 characters. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. But there's a smart way of doing it which, which reduces the character set, uh, but it's hard stuff, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. Text recognition. Uh, so, but you can use packages like Tesseract to solve many problems uh, yeah. in text recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, so we we 
we actually expose you to various libraries and tools that are available mm -hmm. uh, in computer vision too. They're, then, re they're real stuff that I would really use yes, building applications. Use yeah. Right, you use it. Yeah. So this isn't the, uh, you know, kitty version that I yeah. just played with to make a facial recognition thing for right. my car. This is like the real, I'm going to build a piece of software and I know how to do it. Yeah, yeah. And I then, may not be the greatest at it, but I, I have a real solid, you know, this is the right way to go. Yeah, and the thing is that whatever field you choose, you may not be the greatest in any of them, but it gives you pointers, right? That, oh, I want to solve this problem. What Google, what search term should I use, right? <laughs> oh, you want to build an, uh, you know, augmented reality application and you want some markers. What are those markers called? Oh, those yeah. are Aruko markers and I can just print them out from this and, oh, when I print them out, I have to make sure that, you know, what are the things that you have to be careful about? Otherwise, you will... Yeah, uh, so, so that's the... Uh, <laughs> that, yeah, no, that, that's great. It's, it's uh, I'm going to get a job in this, I'm going to do this... I don't necessarily need to be the one that's creating the new version of TensorFlow, right? You know, but I know how to use all those things yeah. and implement them, which to a business yeah. is all they care about, that, right? Yeah, we, uh, unless unless you are Google right. or Stanford, right? You don't, you know, those are the guys that are like, let's actually reinvent, let let's let's take deep learning and make the next version of that yes. deep learning plus or something, right? Right. So, but other than that, there's a whole lot you can do. With with a fraction of the amount of time. Yeah, invested. I like to say that uh, these courses would take you to the frontier of technology. Mm -hmm. You're not pushing the frontier. Right, right there, perfect. So you are at the end of you know you'll know a lot about how how to develop these things, but it's not like you're doing fundamental research in these areas. Right. It's for engineers. It's not for researchers. Right. Right. Researchers can benefit from it, but that's not who we that's designed the, the course for. Got right? it. We like. Our ideal avatar, they say, right? Who's your ideal customer? We think about somebody who has good experience with Python, mm -hmm. but nothing else, right? They mm -hmm. want, they're very motivated and want to uh, join the AI revolution, but they, you know, that's it, uh, that's yeah. it right? Yeah. Uh, and they are good with Python. We don't have to teach them Python, although... The, the cool thing about this field, yeah. and you and all the other friends I know that work in, in similar spaces like this, it, it is... Uh, so uh, applicable to real life. Yeah. You know, and, and I've always worked in the data engineering, data analytics side, so we're dealing with things that are much more abstract. Yeah. I mean, the theory of what you're talking about is certainly very abstract, yeah. but the implication of it, or the implementation of it, is very practical. Yeah. It's image recognition when I'm pointing my phone at something. I know one app, did you ever see the app Word Lens? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Right. Where it would translate text for you in yeah. real time. Yeah. I remember seeing that going, this is magic. This yes. is, you know, I don't know if you feel this way, but you, in your life, you come across these pieces of technology, yeah. especially as someone that, that works in technology mm -hmm. for your living. You come across things that just, just blow your mind a bit. Right. And, and that one blew my mind a bit. And that was real time text recognition yeah. plus NLP to translate it to, because, you know, language doesn't translate right. identically, right? right. So, you know, it would say, you know, say something in Spanish that didn't quite translate to English, but it would give me the English version that was understandable, at least, to where yes. I knew what it meant. Right, right. Yeah. Incredible. Uh, in fact, I have the same feeling. Sometimes I feel that I'm living in the future. Things happen so fast, right? Yeah. That uh, you, we did not expect that we will be here. Uh, the things that we implement ourselves, they blow us away <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> um, like I can't believe that works so well. Look yes. at how you know. Whereas, yeah, I mean, to you know, Back to the Future days, nineteen eighty-five, they this would be science fiction to them. Yeah, and uh, yeah, the, let me finish the final yeah, course. Please. That was uh, the final course is deep learning with PyTorch. Ooh, okay. And uh, OpenCV has mechanism to learn, uh, to use a model that has been trained, a mm -hmm. deep learning model. It has something called a deep uh, neural network module, which allows you to run a model, right, once you have trained it. Mm -hmm. But we don't have any support for training the model itself. Right. And the reason is that we found that, oh, there are these very well-supported libraries, TensorFlow and PyTorch, mm -hmm. which are exceptional. They have teams of hundreds of people, yep. right? And there is no re need to recreate another, yet another framework, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what we do is we enable people to train uh, using PyTorch uh, or TensorFlow, but they can bring their model to OpenCV mm -hmm. and run it, right, in their OpenCV application. Okay. And that running is really fast, right? We, um, 
like for example on CPU, uh, a while back I did uh, we did some tests, uh, not as part of OpenCV uh, team, but as our own internal team, we did some experiments, and we saw that uh, OpenCV's uh, implementation on a CPU, mm -hmm. right, was about uh, you know forty fifty percent times uh, faster than TensorFlow. Wow, right? and the reason is uh, is uh, you're cheating, right? <laughs> well. We OpenCV came out of Intel Labs. Uh -huh. The core team is uh, still at Intel. There are a lot of Intel people are involved, are part of the core team. So they are highly motivated to optimize the library <laughs> for the CPU. To beat Google. To, for the CPU. Oh, right? because they make CPUs. Because right. they make CPUs. Versus GPUs. Right. And for, uh, for Google, that's not a priority, right? Yeah, they just uh, software. They yeah. just care about it working. Yeah, and mostly they care about uh, GPUs and for GPUs, the performance is the same for everybody because uh, NVIDIA produces the drivers, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it's NVIDIA uh, GPUs that are so, more popular. So, so let me, so I got a couple, couple questions that came yeah. up there. What, what is the difference and why would I prefer a CPU versus a GPU? So what is a CPU versus GPU? Just simple definition. Yeah. And then why are GPUs so popular for machine learning stuff? So GPUs basically they can process uh, pixels and parallel. Okay. Right. That's why they they are used in gaming engines that you want to. Uh, let's and say video editing. Map. This is why they're yes. popular in photo editing, video editing. Right. Dealing yeah. with images. Yes. So when you want to process the same pixel in a certain way and you want to apply the same processing to all the pixels, then uh, you they have parallel. You know they are massively parallel. Okay. Uh, right. Uh, so that's why GPUs are uh, important. But they are also very expensive. Yeah. Right. And a CPU doesn't work that way. It's serial, right? Like one by one. Yeah. I mean, there could be multiple threads, and you could do, but it's not that level of parallelization, mm, right? Okay. Uh, the GPU could be hundred times more parallel than a CPU, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, but they are very inexpensive. Uh, if you, uh, if you do this inference, okay. So, uh, there are two things, right? Now, during training, you're running through this massive amount of data, right? Mm -hmm, You're mm -hmm. uh, millions of images, right? Uh, in that case, you want to use a GPU for training a machine learning model or a deep learning model mm -hmm. uh, because it's computationally so expensive. Right. And the difference could be something that, uh, let's say something is five times uh, slower, right? Mm -hmm. uh, your deep learning model trains in one day versus one week. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right? it's a big difference. It's a big difference. How yeah. quickly you can do an experiment so all the training is usually done in uh, GPUs. Got it. Right? Got it. But at the time of inference, you don't have the same, like, let's say. Doesn't matter as much. It's not important. Doesn't matter right? as much, right? Yeah. Uh, let's say uh, you want to do image recognition on a single image, whether it returns in, um, you know, uh, a tenth of a uh, second, or whether it returns in a hundredth of a second, not much of a difference, mm -hmm. right? People will bear that. They won't notice much of a difference. Right, unless you're doing it a million times, right? Yes. But if you're just doing, you know, apply this filter, do this thing to this single image. Yeah, but the cost is also a factor, right? Uh, mm -hmm. When you're, uh, yeah, w when you're doing video processing, right? Yeah. Then that's a different thing. But if people can wait for the image, right, then uh, the cost is pretty big, right? Yeah. You could get a GPU instance for let's say six hundred and fifty dollars uh, per month on mm -hmm. Amazon, and a CPU instance could be, you know, half or even a third of that yeah. cost. Right. So, so if you have to process a lot of stuff or train algorithms, yeah. GPUs are going to be your, your, your friend. Yeah. And then, but if, but at the time of, like, say, using a model to determine something, on a smaller set, yeah. you're going to probably save a lot of money just by going the CPU route. Yes. And do you tell? So if I'm writing in in Python here, and I'm saying, hey, go process this image, or let's say a website is calling it and it's running its algorithm yeah. to determine something and then tell me, uh, I don't know, like let's say uh, identifying is an ID, you know, mm -hmm. the age of a person based on a picture they got. Yeah. That, uh, I'm gonna use a CPU there. And now do I tell it that? Yeah. Or does it automatically, there's maybe under the under the hood, PyTorch or whatever thing I'm using says, oh, well, this is, I'm just going to go CPU because it's quick and easy. Right. And how do you figure that out? So uh, deployment is a whole another uh, okay. ball game, but let me uh, summarize it, right? Uh, let me give a quick sure. overview. 
when you train a model, it has a lot of information that is not necessary to run the model. Mm -hmm. uh, because during training, you have to keep a lot of information which is useful for training. So first of all, when you deploy the model, you remove all that information, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can also optimize the model. So it's not just the CPU and the GPU. You could be running this model on a smart camera, mm. on a, a, what is called a VPU, right? Oh, uh, what is a this? Vector processing unit. Oh, right? okay. So, which is basically, um, uh, it's it's basically or TPU, which is Tensor Processing Unit by Google, right? right. These are s s chips which have been very specifically designed for learning, uh, running deep learning uh, applications. Mm -hmm. And uh, they may have special cores. They may have they may have special engines for uh, doing 16-bit floating point operations mm -hmm. instead of 32-bit, right? Mm -hmm. So you could actually reduce the model size, and 16-bit could be plenty for, for storing their doing. information, yeah. right? It could be without losing much accuracy. You can convert it to 16-bit, and it would run uh, much faster, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And the model size would also be slower. You could also go to 8 bits and things like that, mm -hmm. right? So uh, it's not just between GPU and CPU. You have all this category mm. of uh, devices called edge devices because mm. the processing is happening on the device. And the reason it is important is uh, privacy, right? It's a yeah. big deal. Uh, you don't want to send everything to the cloud mm -hmm. to process. And also for real-time performance, sometimes you may want to do the, uh, you know. What, what's an example of something like that? Like I'm picturing a security system. Let's say yeah. my smart uh, door yeah. just recognizes my face or my gate image, yes. which I don't know what gate means, but it means not just my face, it's my whole body and how I walk or Walking. something. Yeah. yeah. And it just unlocks. Is right. that an idea? And then, it, you know, because if you have to go to the, the internet for that, yeah. your internet could be down and I can't get to my house. Exactly. So, so even outside of privacy, <laughs> this is just a functionally bad idea. Right. Is, like, what examples are there of these kind of applications? Several examples. For example, uh, let's say... Uh, we also have an edge device of, through OpenCV, which is called OpenCV AI Kit. Mm -hmm. It is basically a smart ca smart camera. It has uh, uh, Intel's Myriad X chip in, inside. Okay. It's a it's a chip. It's a VPU, right. uh, okay. which does the processing. And now uh, it also has depth uh, capability, so oh, it has cool. a stereo pair. Okay. So it's a spatial AI. Uh, Stereo pair, like two cameras or like an infrared sensor kind no, of thing? No, it has uh, two cameras. Okay. Two uh, uh, grayscale cameras. So pure image processing or yeah. pure, not pro uh, to pure. <laughs> pure <laughs> <laughs> I did right. it. I did it. Pure <laughs> images, not yeah. uh, radar or something else. Yeah. Yeah. And then there is an RGB camera, which is 4K, uh, mm -hmm. et cetera. Uh, now this, uh, when you're, uh, I'll give you a very simple example. When you use this camera, because it has so much processing on the camera, it can do video encoding on the camera itself. Mm -hmm. And you can actually literally take this camera and plug it into a Raspberry Pi and record 4K uh, That's video. That's amazing. And if you try to do with your MacBook, uh, you know, a yeah. little uh, older MacBook Pro, it's going to, you know, uh, the fans will go off yeah, and things like smoking, that. Yeah, smoking, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so that's the power, right? Uh, that you have processing power. and. When we design, uh, you know, this product has been created in uh, collaboration with a company called Luxonis. And the founder of Luxonis, he was motivated by this idea because he wanted to create a bike safety device mm. where you put it on your bike and uh, it's basically looking behind you mm. for cars, etc. And because you have depth and you know that it's, it's a car, yeah. and if you're able to just give a nudge to that uh, bicyclist, that, oh, there is uh, something coming, coming your way, and yeah. they are going to hit you, right? The difference between life and death is, you know, six inches usually in when you're riding on yeah. the road. And, uh, That's so, incredible. Yeah, and so, so you don't even have the option to go to the internet no. for yeah, it's processing biking, right? this. You, you better, know. and we're talking life and death. Right. Yeah. So uh, in those cases, you don't have access to the internet, right? Mm -hmm. And um, also, I mean, people who are in deep learning, et cetera, uh, they know what kind of, uh, you know, bills they get once. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the AWS, uh, we have customers who pay more than $100,000 a month uh -huh. in AWS charges. Wow. Right? Just for processing. Yeah. yeah. Because they, they, they are processing a lot of data. Yeah. Right? So the more you can do local, local. without that. Yeah. So, so once I train a model, yeah. it has that, I don't know, memory 
I guess you could call it. Yeah. So it doesn't need its training data anymore no. to know when it gets a new image yeah. to apply whatever it's doing. So I, I like to think about these AI models as a black box with knobs. Uh -huh. okay? Let's say there are millions of knobs. Right. right. When the knobs are tuned to the right settings, mm -hmm. they give the right results. Mm -hmm. Right. And then you can throw away the training data because we know the settings of the knobs. Yeah, right, right got it. And these knobs are called weights and biases. Uh -huh. um, uh, you know, that's a neural network term, but they are li literally settings of this. You have defined the architecture, and then uh, there are these settings that you need yeah. to fix. Yeah. And the whole point of training is to write the, get the right knob setting. Interesting. Huh. Right? Once you get this knob setting, just throw away the training like data. You don't like need tuning it. a guitar. You yes. know, yeah. I use the tuner and I got the thing, but once it's set, yeah. I can set it aside for a minute. Right, right. So, yeah, so that's uh, that's the thing. Uh, and then yeah. you could say that, oh, these knob settings, like I was saying that if you want to go to a device which is less capable, mm -hmm. uh, these gonna... knob settings, each one takes 32 bits uh, of information. I can reduce it to 8 bits. And if I'm clever about it, yeah. right, I may just lose some, ins you know, some bits which are not significant, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. They're not really uh, uh, useful. Right. Um, and I can do other things to the neural network. I can look at the neural network and see that, oh, this part of the neural network is not used at all, so mm -hmm. I'm going to chop it off. Mm. <laughs> literally, <laughs> it's called pruning. Pruning. Yeah, yeah, that it technique is called means... pruning. So you chop it off, right? And <laughs> suddenly the neural network becomes half the size and uh, you can uh, load it into uh, less how, capable how big? Yeah, so give me a, a kilobyte or megabyte term. Like if I had a, your bike detection thing, yeah. how big is that model in terms of... You if know, you do naively, it can be hundreds of megabytes. Okay, now right. it's small. A small algorithm would be, or yeah. a small model would be hundreds of megabytes. Hundreds of megabytes. If you okay. just do pretty naively, right? You don't... Mm -hmm. uh, if you are very smart about it, you can bring bring it less than ten megabytes. Oh, okay, wow. Yeah. So that's a huge difference. Yeah, that's a yeah. Because I mean, but storage nowadays is is. No, I mean, it's you can the have memory. A... It's the memory of on. The, it's the fast memory on the device, right? Oh, so okay. you have to load it into that memory, um, and it's not just one algorithm that you're uh, doing, right? Because it's you deep be, learning. It's multiples, right? You could be doing multiple things on the same device, uh -huh. right? If one let's say this has uh, you know uh, 100 megabytes of memory or let's say even a gigabyte uh, but if you're doing 20 things on it and each one uh, is takes, a model that yeah. you know takes some uh, it'll eat can, that up it, and and, and uh, so so w is in deep learning deep learning being mini okay is neural network and deep learning do those mean the same thing they mean the same thing okay um, and uh, like i said that Basically, when the neural network has more than one hidden layer, yes. it is called deep learning. Right. Okay. Okay. So you can have a neural network that isn't deep learning. Yeah. Okay. Nobody Would, uses them. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. But you could. Okay. Yeah. So, all right. So if we have a neural network with multiple layers, yeah. are all of the layers um, additive? So, so let's say I have a picture and, or yeah, let's say I'm Google Photos, something yeah. that everyone, and, and I have a user that wants to search for. Uh, pictures of a, of a dog, mm -hmm. let's say, and it's their photo, so by searching for dog, yeah. chances are it's going to be their dog or a friend's right. dog or something. So they have a, tons of images. Yeah. Is it first, um, do, do they go in layers, do they go in sequential, so it's object detection first, like, oh, there is a animal mm -hmm. here, and then next one, what kind of animal is it? Right. Oh, it's a dog. Okay, yeah. then what kind of breed of dog is it? Right. And then what color of the fur is it? Right. Like, is that how generally how it works? And you That's... say... Cool, we're going to have a 15-layer neural network yeah. for photos of dogs to, to, in the end, be able to tell you everything you ever wanted to know about this dog. Is that how you design them, or is, there, is it more amb ambiguous than that? No, so you don't design uh, them like that, per okay. se. Right? Yeah, so how do you do that? Uh, you design them, so it's funny that people had, used to have these new... Uh, these various layers. Mm -hmm. When you analyze the layers, you would see that oh, the uh, the initial layers, right? They would be uh, looking for very low level features mm -hmm. like edges, right? Some of the neurons would fire on edges. Mm -hmm. Some others would fire on corners, right? So there are these building blocks. Even hu humans, right? Mm -hmm. uh, our visual system doesn't respond if there is no motion. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, we, something moves and it catches our attention, yeah. right? Because our neurons are uh, wired to fire for uh, motion or edges, mm -hmm. right? And you don't even detect, suppose there is a completely white wall, 
Mm -hmm. You're facing a completely white wall. It's flat. There's, there are no features. If the wall is moving, you won't be able to tell anything. <laughs> right? right. But if there is an edge, you would be able to tell the motion in one direction, mm -hmm. right? which is perpendicular to that edge. Uh, right. And if there is a corner or a feature point there, then you will be able to tell the motion in both directions. Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, so neural networks also try to determine those kinds of features, which mm -hmm. are low level, right, at various places in the image, at various locations of the image. Mm. And gradually, you start, they start building uh, that level of abstraction. Okay. And if you look at the, uh, what they are seeing in the final layers, you can almost see the wheels of uh, cars that, oh, <laughs> oh that, that sort of looks like, that feature that it is looking at sort of looks like the wheel. Got it. So, so it's, it's trying to uh, identify things or whatever it's doing in the similar way that our brain and our visual our visual processing system works, which yeah. isn't to say, is that a dog, yes or no? That's like a much later question. That's right? a much later question. It's more like, what even am I looking at? Yes. Are there objects in here? And, you know? uh, and in image classification, you're trying to see, uh, say that, what are the features that would separate a dog from a cat? Mm. You're not trying to identify a dog. You're, not, you're trying to classify an image into these categories, mm -hmm. right? So all the, all the uh, images in the same category, right? Mm -hmm. They should cluster together, yeah. right? Whatever transfer function you're using in this black box. Mm -hmm. And all the things that belong to different classes, they should be separated, mm. right? So, so it's learning features that will be able to tell the difference between right. a, a dog and a cat, right? Uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say you had a dog and a cat and they both wore a bell, right? A bell would feel like a, and you're building a classifier that separates a do dogs from cats, mm -hmm. right? A bell would look like an interesting feature, right? Yeah. Um, humans would, be, uh, would catch that. Yeah. But if you train a neural network, it would not even consider that bell, right? right? Because it's not helping it separate the two classes. Because they both have it. Because they both have it, yeah. right? So it's looking for features. First of all, it's looking for general features which are helpful in... Mm -hmm. uh, size, shape. Uh, size, shape, corners, and things like that. Yeah. Right? And then it's gradually building uh, the mm. abstraction, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, and if you look at the last few layers, it would start looking like, oh, it's looking for dogs and cats, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, in that it, sense, you're right. Even it, though it's not exactly designed. It's not how I was thinking of it, which is a very human way yeah. of thinking of it. It's right. more of the how our brain actually processes it yeah. uh, any, to any image, right. right? Okay, so let's fast forward and go to, I'm working at Google now. Yeah. What tools am I using and what kind of things am I even doing? I mean, I guess I could be working on a product like a yeah. Google Photos or yeah. Street View or whatever actual Google products that people know of. Right. But like what kind of... Am I writing Python code every day? Am I using C++ code every day? Right. And I, mean, I guess Google's a giant company, so it's right. hard. But like, what does a working professional at a high-level company like a Google or a Facebook or somebody like that doing on a day-to-day -day basis? What does that day in the life look like? Right. So for somebody at Google who's working on a product, they're not developing the TensorFlow library, mm -hmm. right? Because that's a different skill set. That's a different team. Yeah. Right. That's a different team. But and is TensorFlow are... open source? TensorFlow is open source, okay, so PyTorch is open source. Okay, so these are open source projects yeah. with tons of people at, say, Google and other companies yeah. coming together. Yeah. Got it. And uh, so uh, suppose you're using TensorFlow to solve a machine learning problem, mm -hmm. right? Then on a day-to-day -day basis, you're trying to you know, get the data set, right? Mm -hmm. And then you're training the models to solve your specific problem, right? Mm -hmm. It could be a text-based uh, NLP problem, speech problem, or but you're using the same tools, right? Mm -hmm. Or vision problem, you're using the same tool to, uh, to do this. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole you know, pipeline of things. First of all, you have to gather the data or you use publicly available data sets. You have to uh, you know, very carefully look at the data set uh, you know, for biases and this things This is where like the that. ethics yeah. part comes in. Yeah. yeah. And then uh, you're building, you're training a model, right? And when somebody like Google uses, uh, trains a model, they just, you know, they're using a farm of uh, servers, yeah. servers, right? <laughs> and, oh, how nice that would be, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, and it, it's funny, some of the models that they build, um, they work only at large scale, 
-hmm. right? For lower scale, it doesn't, uh, the model would not. So this is where they open source this and yeah. you go, cool, but I'm not Google, so this isn't going to no, help No, they me. have a slightly different, <laughs> so uh, for one of the models, I can't remember which one, the open source version was different from. Uh, oh, okay, than their the, own. The, the, their own because uh, the open source version was a much smaller data set that they used. And the same, the same architecture doesn't work uh, for that scale. Right? Yeah. The, Google is a very different we, we, we did this at Facebook too, where we had, the data we had at Facebook was so large um, that the team created a thing called Hive, yeah. which was a way to query the data on, these, on Hadoop, which is a massive data yeah. store, database kind of platform. And, then they, they open sourced it and became a full on, it's a full on thing now. Yeah. But like the internal version of it was always more unique in, in different ways because there were things that only made sense and applied when you had 300 petabytes right. of data. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas the, gen, the open source was much more general application. So I get that, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, so uh, basically you would be doing that and then uh, if, but you could be a, engineer who trains a neural network, mm -hmm. but you could also be an engineer who's much closer to the product where you're using the neural network that somebody else has trained and making it work on the deployment side. Got it, right. So, so yeah, because that's what I was trying to get at. So I know in the data side, we have, you know, we have things called like an analytics engineer versus a platform engineer, yeah. which is like very similar. So, you, so you're saying, so what are the different roles here? in let's say a Google Photos team or something like that, or a company that uses a, makes a product that is high, heavy on computer vision. Yeah, so uh, one of the rules would be, you know, the all the data curation that would be handled by a different team, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and data curation, cleaning up the data, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And then there is a team that actually works on training the model, mm -hmm. right? These people would try out different architectures. They would run several experiments to train a, a model. And finally, these people, these are mostly researchers. If if they are working on something cutting edge, mm -hmm. then these are very researchy people. So they are, really understand the theory, yeah. what's going on behind the scenes, where they may even, would they, let's say they're not getting the results they want, yeah. it, it, could they, you know, I could imagine, would they hit a point where they're like, oh, TensorFlow, actually, this is a limitation of it. Yeah. We need to maybe update TensorFlow, the library itself, yeah. or, or, get someone else to do that for us. So it, though, that's where that would happen. Right, so uh, yeah, for example, there may be a new kind of layer that they came up with, right? And they would, you know, in most of these frameworks, you can create a custom layer, which will not be as efficient, mm -hmm. but you can create but it. But it works. It works, yeah. right? Uh, and then uh, if the uh, thing becomes popular, then the TensorFlow team would come and implement that. Say, hey, this is good, let's yes. do this. Yeah, yes. let's add that, it to our project. That's available as part of the library, right? Mm -hmm. And then, the, uh, but it doesn't stop there, right? They have to make, there's a lot of effort that goes into taking this model and making it available for different devices, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So the same model or similar models, right, would be, has to work on Android, mm -hmm. right? So a version, if not the same model, uh, has to work on Android, it has to work on uh, the cloud, uh, on the cloud. Web-based, yeah. Yeah, web-based. Uh, sometimes it needs to uh, work on the browser itself, right? Mm -hmm. So there are these different versions of the model that need to be deployed, mm -hmm. and that's uh, that kind of optimization. Mm -hmm. is Interesting. So it's very not. Different. So when I've deployed Python stuff in the past, yeah. and I say I as in my team because yeah. I'm you know a dinosaur, I don't know how to do these things, but we would implement things as in we would have data scientists come up with algorithms for predictions, let's yeah. say, and then we would have our engineers, which were data engineers take that and it was usually some form of python code mm -hmm. then you would have the application team where basically an api call or a message from kafka or some way would trigger go run that python code right but the python code never that changed, changed. Yes. it was always the same yeah so are you saying that we would have if i wrote a python um you know piece of code that was my computer vision algorithm yeah. model that I would have to have different versions of that depending on how it's being implemented? Yeah, and sometimes there is a completely different team whose responsibility is to optimize the model. Okay. So this model is not usually a Python uh, code. Okay. There could be Python code around it. Right. But this is usually a binary file which stores all the weights and biases. Got it, got right? it, yeah. So, because at this point we're talking 
devices. Yeah, we are and, talking devices, performance, yeah. all those yeah, things. Yeah, so every bit matters. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Okay. So Python, as nice and good as it is to write the code and get the logic and has yeah. beautiful and easy to share the code, yeah. the computer doesn't give a crap about how beautiful the code is. It just wants it to work yes. and work really quickly. So good. usually there is a separate, you know, runtime mm -hmm. that actually takes this model and performs the inference. Wow. And this runtime would know about the architecture at the at the processor level. Wow, right? yeah. So one great. such thing, a framework is OpenVINO, for example, from Intel. OpenVINO? Yes. Like wine? Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Open V-I-N-O, yeah. Yeah, wine, yeah. Yeah, in Spanish, anyways. Yes. Yeah. So uh, it, uh, yeah, the, the, the whole point of that is it wants to, you take a model and then you run it through their, you know, processing, uh -huh. uh, and you create a representation of the model which can, can be deployed on a CPU. If, you if your target is a CPU, sure. then it would use certain parameters. Right? Wow. If your target is something else, then it would optimize it for that processor, mm -hmm. uh, et cetera. So there is, yeah, that's a whole. Uh, you wow, know, I mean, that, that alone is probably. And, and OK, and then these are the folks that actually, and then there's the product team yeah. who, let's say, builds you know, the user interface yes. of the program, which has maybe right. very little to do with the actual Right. Uh, computer vision model, or let's say machine learning model, yeah. it just says, user inputted this, go call that thing. Yes. <laughs> Give me the results. Right. This is how you display the results, right? So the, probably the, the product team is probably pretty far removed, You would you say? I, I would say. Yeah. yeah. I would say that the, the final product team could be very far removed. Or from let's this. say the user interface team, right? Yes. So there's another team which has nothing to do with yeah. all the stuff we've talked about right. here. Or nothing they're they're working loosely. at an API level, right? Yeah. Or, I call this function and it gives me the detected yeah, cases. Yeah, and if it's giving me the wrong results, yeah. you got to go talk to the other team. Right. I don't know why it is because yeah. that's beyond my scope. Okay. Right. right. So there are there are various categories of machine learning yeah. engineers. Um, it, right. So and, and so then that's from from start to finish. Yeah. Is there more roles? I mean, management and all that. But I mean, is there any other functional like this is my day-to-day -day job, writing code, doing things? Well, there is this whole ML ops thing, right? Okay. Um, uh, which... Uh, which is similar to what I mentioned before, but it also, it is a continuous, they would implement things like continuous continuous integration. Mm. When you create a new model, it has to go through a large test suite yeah. to make sure that there are no biases. It has to be better than the previous model. Yep. So uh, all Can't those break things anything. cannot break anything. Right. So it goes through and it works wow. on all devices. Right. Well, yeah, I was going to say, because that's massive, because now, yeah. now you're doing true end-to-end -end testing. Yes. Right, yeah, yes, it has to be better, remove biases, blah, 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 but, right. but also it also... Devices, it cannot screw up the performance on any specific device. Right. So they would obviously have an array of devices on which the accuracy is tested, mm -hmm. right, um, and uh, the speed is tested that, okay, it's actually better than the previous one. Right. And based on that, they make a call whether it actually deploys on. Wow, them. okay. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense because then, yeah, because if your, if your model spit back one different attribute in its results, I don't yeah. know if it's using JSON or XML or something like that, but if it had a different name for an attribute yeah. that the front-end UI didn't right. expect, then it could break the whole thing. Yeah. Right. right, got it. Yeah, so you have to test all that stuff. Yes, and usually in software engineering, right, we have uh, unit tests mm -hmm. and we have integration tests, mm -hmm. right? You test small components mm -hmm. and you test the entire system. Mm -hmm. But here, in addition to those, you also have the whole model testing. It mm -hmm. has to be tested on various devices before, at least in a company like Google, right? right? right. A lot of smaller companies, they are deploying on a single... Um, yeah, just go for it. Yeah, right. just, <laughs> you still have to... If it breaks, it. roll it back, <laughs> right? I only test my code, but when I do, it's in production, right? <laughs> That's right. Um, now, uh, so with so is there QA engineers involved? I mean, are these people doing QA, or do you have a separate team doing QA? So there is there there could be other teams uh, which, uh, so when something fails, right, it may not be obvious that it failed. Mm. It right? Just gave you a bad result, and you don't know, yeah. right? So it is possible. Uh, uh, it, it is definite that uh, these uh, large companies they employ a very large group of uh, quality assurance people who mm -hmm. sample the data, right? Mm -hmm. So all the, they, they actually sample, it's reviewed by humans, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, if there are mistakes, it goes back to the So, so this is when Google is collecting data or Amazon or somebody is yeah. uh, listening to your conversations from your smart speaker yeah. or things like that 
to see that, oh, you asked it what time of day it is, and it gave you uh, something about Napoleon. Yeah. And the computer may not have cared right. or known that those were completely unrelated yeah. because the model said they were. Right. But you as a human obviously know, knew that was wrong. Right. right. And sometimes uh, the system that they have engineered, it is able to tell that a mistake was made. Mm. Right. That, oh, uh, the human asked something, but the response was, you know, based on user behavior, they could say that there must have been a mistake. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But there are other cases where they cannot tell the difference. So you always have to sample the data. Yeah, sure. Um, just to see. Just to see. Because otherwise, what you'll have is people going on social media saying, this sucks. Right. <laughs> and you're going, ah, yeah. you know, we put so much work into this. It's fascinating, too. I mean, I think uh, part of the key there that I've seen where it's gone wrong is, uh, people having the wrong metrics for success. Where I remember I was at a company and they implemented a new search algorithm. Mm -hmm. It wasn't actually a new algorithm, it was a whole new um, search platform which mm -hmm. had different algorithms, right? And uh, the, comp the product team saw that the number of searches went through the roof. Mm. And they were like, great, more people are using search. Right. But the problem of course is, search, you want a lower number. Because what that means is they found what they were looking for. <laughs> right, right. So if the average number of searches per person per day yeah. triples, it means they're not, the results are not good. Yes. Right? It's, there's no, no other reason to explain why everybody started searching in triplicate other than you, your new algorithm sucks. Right. Right? So, so depending on what your measures of success are, yeah. you, those need to be grounded to reality. So Yeah, and then there, there are some data problems also. Sometimes it can happen... Uh, like I was saying that uh, back in the day when the data sets used to be small. Mm -hmm. So somebody had, uh, you know, a few categories of uh, data. And uh, among that data set, uh, all the categories had similar error rates. But this fish category was performing very well. <laughs> the fish, you could detect fish very accurately, uh -huh. right? And the reason is that if you go, went and looked into the data set, the fish was rotated uh, always. Somebody had... So you take a picture of a plate, yeah. right, where you have uh, the fish, and that was always being detected properly. And the reason is that this person who created the data set, they, uh, because fish is usually long, right, they turned the, uh, they always made the fish horizontal. Yeah. So creating these black triangles, right, um, on the side. Uh -huh. uh, so the whole image is rotated, right? And uh, so you get these black triangles on the side if you don't yeah. add it right, right? So it was a back, black triangle detector. So the algorithms <laughs> would just look at, oh, those are four uh, black triangles. Must be triangles. a fish. Yeah. Must be a fish, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it, has, it was not even looking at uh, the fish. Yeah, it didn't even care. It yeah. just saw those uh, markers yeah. and saw that. Okay, so in terms of a job prospects, yeah. am I, if I'm a, if I've been, I went through your whole program. Yeah. Uh, am, is there a way for me to do these things in public, like on GitHub or something like that, to where people can see me and recognize me for yeah. my work, and then I'll get a job that way? I actually, we encourage people to, uh, you know, the economy is such that uh, you have to show what you have done. Right. Right. It's uh, and the best way to do it is write blog posts. Mm -hmm. Right. There is something called Kaggle. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the data com the data contests. Yeah. Yeah. So you can actually participate in those competitions, and you learn a lot by uh, you know being in that community. I, I didn't know they worked for they had uh, computer vision stuff. Oh, they had. I, I, yeah. I knew. Were they the ones that did the Netflix prize? No, Netflix. Uh, that Netflix did it. It was that, on its own. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But uh, it's a very good way to learn. People are sharing their recipes, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. Good practices, etc. So uh, we encourage them to, in fact, in one of the courses, we tell them, oh, go do this as a project. Go, uh, implement, uh, go yeah. do a, a Kaggle competition, participate in this ca Kaggle competition mm -hmm. so that they know the process, just the process of going and doing a Kaggle competition, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so yeah, so those things, and, and we also encourage them to actually publicize what yeah. they have learned, right? Mm -hmm. Share in it fact, on social media or whatever else. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and one of the instructors we recently hired uh, was uh, he, ha he has taken one of our courses. <laughs> right? oh, nice, nice. Uh, so it, I mean, but he has been in the aerospace industry for more than two decades. Oh, wow. Yes. Super and cool. 
as part of his job, he started looking into computer vision. He got very interested in it. He started taking courses, and he took one of our course, uh, Deep Learning with PyTorch, and we just were interacting with him, and we just knew that this guy is, has built up his knowledge yeah. to quite an extent. And we needed, uh, we had an opening, uh, we interviewed him and then uh, so, he finally got a job. So other than uh, Kegel, any other websites that if I'm a young, want to, you know, I want to get a job in computer vision, yeah. in blog posts, yeah. any other places I can share my work? Uh, I would say that GitHub is, GitHub, GitHub? LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah, publish your code on GitHub. Okay. Uh, the projects you do, you know, publicize them on LinkedIn. LinkedIn is very good sure. for these kind of visual things, right? Yeah. So publicize and not LinkedIn. Um, and um, yeah, that that's... that's. So, so get my name out there. Now, now, what are the job prospects? I imagine they're great. They're great. Like, like if I've been doing this, let's say I've spent a year, right? Yeah. Getting, learning, doing projects, doing yeah. things on Kaggle, publishing my code on GitHub, making a blog post, YouTube yeah. videos, whatever I can do. And I'm hireable, yeah. right? Like if, 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 if I was that person and you're talking to me as an expert in here, you could say, yep, this guy's a knowledgeable enough to do, you know, to be a mid-level whatever. Right. What kind of money am I going to make? Yeah. Like, so like, like me, how, how easy is it going to be to get a job? Google's maybe a separate category, but, right. you know, everyone else. So uh, part of the reason my consulting company is growing uh, very fast is that people cannot hire Google engineers. Of and course. We, we always heard these rumors about, you know, how much they get paid. Mm -hmm. But then this professor um, uh, at Georgia Tech, she actually got real uh, job offers, right? She went to all the people who had real job offers, verified it manually, and put it on a website. It is called AIPayGrades.es. Okay, for Spain? So, uh, yes. It, yeah. It, basically, it says AIPayGrades. Pay oh, got you, yeah. But the last, the dot is, you know... Got uh, it. Uh, dot .es, right? So if you go to that, it's just staggering. It's mind-boggling. And level six engineer uh, at Google or Facebook makes a million dollars. Yeah, okay. Right, this is an engineer. This is not a management role or, you know, yeah. they, they are not a VP of something. Or They are basically level six engineers, which is a, you know, yep. uh, they're they are pretty and, top. And this field. is a senior position. Yeah. What's the low end of that? What's a level one um, computer vision engineer get? It's still, you know, out of the out of college, I have seen people getting, uh, you know, 120, 130k. Yeah, uh, as kind of entry level. As an entry level. And uh, and of entrance. course, we're talking here about say US. Silicon Valley. Yeah. yeah, U.S. Right. So different parts of the world, it's going to be a different animal. Uh, yeah, right, obviously. Yeah. Um, uh, one of our interns who has, uh, you know, she's in India. Mm -hmm. She recently got a job, which um, which is ten times of what I had, I had never joined back in India. You know, I came for grad school, mm. but I did, uh, you know, I did sit, sit for an interview just so I, uh, just to have a backup in case something went wrong with the sure. immigration thing, et cetera, yeah. right? Yeah. So the job at uh, that time, what I got, uh, this was 20 years back, but at that time it was considered very respectable, uh -huh. uh, the offer that I had received. She... Uh, of course, it is 20 years later, but she has got an offer which is 10 times, 10 <laughs> times of what I had received. I mean, uh, does that say it's just how the times have changed or how good she is compared to maybe how you were 20 years <laughs> <laughs> You know, who knows? Yeah. No, well, the, the fact is that uh, uh, I was going to say kids. But <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> but, right. Uh, these days, they know so much, right? Yeah. When I graduated as an undergrad, I had not done so many projects as uh, these people have done. So mm -hmm. they have real experience because the tools are there, right? Well, I was going to say deep learning wasn't even a thing, right? It, it was, was not even a tool. Yeah. There are so many tutorials out there. You can just pick it up. You can apply it. You can have real, you're yeah. really prepared for the job, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. in that sense, you're right that these uh, new students, they are really equipped. They're capable, yeah. yeah. They're very capable. Now, 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 do people specialize in something like NLP versus speech versus computer vision? Or if I'm going to work at a Facebook or Google or, you know, if I'm that talented, yeah. am I just generally a machine learning person? Like, like, like how, what's the distinction there? The top people, the top, top people, they can work in any... They can do it all. Yeah. And, and, and but, things like PyTorch and TensorFlow make it so yeah. I can, I can do those things yeah. regardless. Now, if I want to be the implementation guy, I'm 
different animal, right? Yes. Because how you implement speech versus vision is probably right. very different. There are nuances right? and various things, right? Sure. Uh, that it's not just, uh, there are certain nuances that, oh, how do you, let's say face recognition, right? Face recognition, if you, uh, when you take an image of a face, you uh, align it properly, yeah. the recognition rate will shoot up, right? Yeah. So it's simple things like that, which uh, you know just by being in the field, uh, those nuances will be lost if you're trying to do too, too many yeah. things. So, uh, so when, is one easier to get a job in than another or to learn maybe? There is, uh, I have a bias, but yeah. uh, I think computer vision is uh, probably going to, it is still probably the biggest one among the three. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be big because it's a passive. So think about all the places you have microphones, very few. Mm -hmm, right. Mm -hmm. Think about all the places you have a camera. Yeah. It's all, all over. over the place. Yeah. Right. And that data is very rich. Visual data, speech data is not as rich mm -hmm. as visual data. And you know that from human brain also, our brain right. spends, uh, you know, 30% uh, of its uh, processing power on well, and, visual. It, yeah, I mean, so in, and in my courses about data visualization, yeah. charts and graphs, yeah. we, I talk about that a lot, how, yeah. why do charts and graphs even exist? Right. Why don't we just look at a big table of numbers? Exactly. And, and, and the answer is because when we read numbers, we are reading them. And reading is a, a thing where even if we're not verbalizing it, yeah. internally we're essentially s using speech yeah. to consume those numbers. Yeah. Whereas a shape or a color mm -hmm. or a position on the page or an orientation of an object, we're just how we've evolved as animals. I agree. It's just directly wired into our brain. It's something like like sixteen times or something faster. Yep. The data gets to your you know your cortex, your decision making part, to say what's going on. Yeah, and uh, so yeah, so visual uh, you know cameras are everywhere. Yeah, right. It's uh, everywhere, and visual data is very rich, and the processing power, uh, the cost of processing is. Going what, down. what about camera? You know, because I you know do this for a living now. I have a sense of how cameras work. Yeah. Uh, it's you know so a, a good example um, was I, I know that in uh, London I think it is they were doing this thing where in the in the subway they were trying to estimate when a train is coming, mm -hmm. and the way that they do that uh, tradition modernly in say Paris or something is actually extremely uh, there's a lot of infrastructure mm -hmm. involved. Right. But. I can just put a GoPro up yep. and <laughs> use some very simple models right. to figure out how fast it's going. I know where the camera is. Yep. I know exactly how far the route is. Right. I know how fast it's going. This isn't hard math to tell you. And then I can just wire that to a sign in the station of when it's going to be there. Right. But we're talking about light. And cameras, as we as they work, work like our eyes, where we yep. have light in the visible spectrum, at least yep. cameras that... We're talking about there's right. other cameras but but so yes yes it's cheap the processing power yeah. is good and all that but if we're talking about the visible light spectrum yeah. to get in a clear image in a very low light setting yeah. it's very difficult and the sensor has to be big and it's expensive and all that so how do you deal with that well so the thing is that first of all uh, even if you're not dealing with uh, rgb light let's say you're dealing with other kinds of uh, modalities, LiDAR or other things. Sure. Even that is computer vision, yeah, right? So right. that, uh, as long as you get the data as a 2D <laughs> image, right, <laughs> uh, you can use the same processing techniques. Okay. Right. So the processing of the image, but what about the collection of the image is what I'm saying. Like if you need a high resolution camera, yeah. 4K that's getting, R by RGB you mean the things we see. Yes. Right? Yeah. For, 4 k full frame sensor, I'm talking $3,000 for the camera. Right. You know, so are there answers to that? Can we not use such a high quality sensor and still get enough useful information? Well, there are, uh, it also depends on which part of the spectrum you are trying to uh, analyze, right? Okay. For example, uh, uh, during nighttime, right? And if you're working with humans, then you can use IR and it will do a very good job, right? right? You can go even further and create thermal sensors, mm -hmm. right? which are uh, work with body heat and things like that, which are used in security Can, cameras and, and all the time. At this point, they don't care if there's visible light out or not. Yes. Right? Because that's not the, the, the spectrum. So the, the visible light spectrum that we know it is the part of the electromagnetic spectrum yes. that we can perceive we can see, with our... But the cameras are not limited by that. Exactly, right. Yeah. So they can see infrared and things like this, you know. And even ultraviolet, right? There is yeah. uh, 
in the ultraviolet spectrum also you do uh, certain kinds of computer vision. Uh, well, I mean, even things. if you think about when you break a bone, you have an X-ray. Yes. Well, X-ray is just another type, uh, another exactly. frequency on the electromagnetic spectrum. Yeah. You just need a different kind of camera, we'll call it that. Yeah, know, it's a different tools. kind of camera, and it's uh, what, what you're measuring is basically the density. You yeah. know, the brighter things are more dense. Yeah. Um, so you're measuring the density instead of the surface yeah. uh, reflection. Yep. Right. All right, so I got, I got one more topic I want to talk about. Yeah. Because we, we we just went for a drive in a you know we'll put air quotes around self driving car right how in, without getting into I don't you know you need you to explain to me how self driving cars work or will work but I just want to get your sense of like how likely do you think self driving cars are within the next five years ten years etc you know knowing about what you know about computer vision right. how hard something like this would be. Um, what's, what's your general sense on self-driving cars and how quick or you know, far away they are? These, these technologies are so uh, deceptive in the sense that uh, if you ask... So 2005, uh, we had uh, the DARPA Grand Challenge, right? For the first time yeah. in human history, uh, a car traveled 132 miles... Through uh, the De Nevada desert, right? Through the Nevada desert yeah. to complete the DARPA Grand Challenge. And uh, by the way, that... Uh, the computer vision library used was OpenCV. Nice. In that car, right? And the founder of OpenCV, Gary Bradsky, was part of the team. Be uh, yeah, well, great. And uh, the main guy was Sebastian Thurn, who, uh, who's the founder of Udacity. Oh, nice. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so that, at that time, the optimism was so high that in 10 years, we are now just 10 years away. Because that, if you look at all the documentaries about that particular, uh, it was not an easy trail. It was, uh, you know, of course there is no traffic because there is, uh, it's a desert. I, I, I remember the whole thing about they had to move turtles because there were desert tortoises and if you scared them, they would, they would pee. And, <laughs> and, if, and if they lost their pee, they were going to die. Wow. Because they're in the desert. So right. they, would, they would hold, anyways, yeah. I, I remember hearing a lot about that. Yeah, so it, it was a big deal at that time, and the optimism was that, oh, in 10 years. And mm -hmm. that was the first time I thought uh, that, yes, we will actually have self-driving cars in 10 years. Right, because right? here's and an we, example. It works. We're talking 2005. Yes, you know, in 10 years. The yeah. iPhone didn't even exist. Right. Right, come on. And all the things that happened afterwards, they convinced me more and more that, oh, we are, we are very close, we are very close, uh -huh. right? Uh -huh. And by 2015, these, uh, all the deep learning stuff had happened. And now you're thinking that, oh, it's just around Guaranteed. the corner. We're Guaranteed. Guaranteed, yeah. right? It is just that, and Google has already driven, um, you know, I don't know how many uh, million miles. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so, but we are still not there, right? Because the corner cases are uh, really where all the, uh, you know, uh, thing is. Uh, so I, I don't know. Uh, it's a very difficult question to answer, mm -hmm. but it's not in the five, uh, next five years. Full autonomy is yeah. not happening in the next five years. We'll obviously what about 10? 10? 10 years is what, you know, it's a very <laughs> cliche thing to say. Everything that you don't know about, you say it's going to happen in 10 years. Yeah, right? nuclear fusion, right? It's, it's yeah. always 10 years away. Right. Yeah, th that's the most interesting thing. And, and I think, would you agree that the, the reason why it's those edge cases, right? Because let's say we were building a, a different kind of uh, AI machine learning type system. Yeah. Um, the consequences aren't so great. If I you know, am using a, a face filter on Snapchat, which yep. is doing these really fancy things. Yep. If that fails and who crashes cares? my right. camera on my phone, who cares? Yep. If my self-driving car fails, yep. I'm dead. Yep. I greatly care yep. about not being dead. Right. So, so like, I mean, what, what level of certainty do we need? You know, so you're talking about decreasing the losses. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah, it's a real loss. <laughs> How far, knowing that we can't ever get to zero. Yeah. But let, let's say, you know, what, what a human, um, a person dies every 400,000 miles or something in a car. Yeah. That, or, you know, generally speaking. So what, where do we need to be? You know what I mean? Is it, we, we can't be zero. Yeah. But, but how many miles do we need to drive on an autonomous car, you know, with a one person dying before generally we're like, let's go. And this is a personal opinion. I'm not asking you to be, no, no, no. you know, so the I, expert I, on it. 
what I feel, what I feel is that it's more of a political question, mm. right? Whether we will be able to convince people, because everybody thinks that they are a very good driver. You know, they, <laughs> they dri they're in the top ten percent of, of drivers. Of course, right? everyone is. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so they all feel that that way. So they want and and the level of control they want, right? So th that's that's one thing, right? That uh, they feel that oh, uh, they need to have this control. Yeah. The but the other thing which could happen much earlier uh, is uh, fleets of cars, mm -hmm. right? Driving autonomously, and there, uh, you know, first of all, you can put a lot more sensors, mm -hmm. right? You can have uh, a self-driving uh, bus, which is a million dollars, right? Right, and you will recover the cost very quickly because you don't need a driver now, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and it's traveling much farther and whatnot, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you can have a very expensive uh, bus, and it's driving people autonomously, and at some level, people don't care, right? They have because I'm not going to be driving like a bus a, anyways, right? I'm yeah. not driving a bus and. Uh, you know, if the safety is better than humans, right? I'm not in control. I was not in control either way. Yeah, and right. if I, I would be in a bus with someone else driving. Right. And if you can prove that on an average that this thing does, let's say, 10 times better mm -hmm. uh, than a human, I would go on that bus. Right. Right. No problem. But when it comes to personal, uh, that, oh, you're saying that I'm not better than this, <laughs> 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 right? Then it becomes uh, very... Um, uh, Subjective. Well, thing. it's our ego, of, right? We're humans. Our, I mean, we have these incredible biases. We are, we're, we're, you know, humans are incredible, yeah. and what we're wired to do. Yeah. Driving was not something that we were have evolved to do. Yeah. Like in our human history, it's extremely new to right. us, right? And but being arrogant or having a big ego yeah. is very, uh, very uh, natural to yeah. all of us. So, but we are also very uh, biased towards convenience. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Imagine, uh, you know, somebody telling you that, oh, you want to uh, you want to be in this metal case uh, inside a metal case with, you know, uh, 15, 20 gallons of explosive, <laughs> uh, which is being uh, burnt uh, inside the vehicle. It is literally being exploded it's, while you're yeah, in it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, you know, the chances of this thing going up in flames is very high, you would think, right? Yeah. But then it normalizes, right? It's not happening. Oh, these are th these things are safe. Every once in a yeah. while, uh, something goes It took goes a long up. time, though. Yeah. If you look back, and this is something I, I've done a bit of research on, uh, you know, the fascinating numbers are always, um, you know, humans, uh, and we'll say homo sapiens, have been around for, what, 10,000 or so years. Mm -hmm. uh, 5,000 or so of those, we used horses mm -hmm. for transportation, for literally everything, right? Right for all kinds of different terms, and then in thirty years, no more horses, right? Cars, yeah. But thirty years is still a long time, right? In in a human's lifespan, right? So if we think about it, I mean, uh, you know, are we at the dawn? Like, do you do you feel we are still at? Let's say let's say it takes fifteen years, yeah, to go to go from I'm going to drive to where I don't I don't want to drive. It drives for me. Yeah. Uh, are we in day one of that? Or are we at year five of that? How you know how far? Because I mean, I guess the DARPA challenge, but I mean, is that was that you know pre-birth? Like like what? Like where are we at? Do you think in it this was curve the proof of, of concept? Right. Uh -huh. The DARPA challenge was the proof of concept that it is feasible. Right. We mm -hmm. so the year before that, two thousand four, they had the DARPA grant ch uh, challenge. Same thing. Uh, they had to drive one hundred and forty-two miles, uh, and no car. I think traveled more than seven miles. They all crashed, <laughs> right? Yeah. And within a year, you see this huge, massive progress that, oh, uh, there were three or four cars that actually completed uh, mm -hmm. the full challenge, maybe mm -hmm. five cars. Uh, so that was a massive leap in a single year. So you can imagine the level of yeah. optimism. And that was, you know, 15, 16 years ago, right? Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, once this autonomous vehicle starts, first of all, we will, I think what they should do is make certain highways and places that are, we can call them autonomous vehicle compliant or, you know, friendly, right? Sure. That on these, we have tested so much that between San Diego and Los Angeles, you can go autonomously, mm -hmm. right? There would be no uh, police, <laughs> sure. right? And people will do that. And gradually, that's how people will get accustomed to this, uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, yes, this is safe, right? Mm -hmm. And people, th these companies have to be exceptionally careful about this, almost like 
how we treat uh, air travel. Yeah. A single mistake, uh, we analyze it to, uh, you know, a lot yeah. to make sure that it never happens again. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't see that level of ethics in, uh, you know, Uber, for example, they rush things, right? Mm -hmm. Google is doing very good in that sense. They are uh, exceptionally careful in how they are. Uh, right. Low speeds, known routes, those kind of things. Yeah, and then they are also very careful. They are not overhyping and thing, ca calling uh, this thing an autopilot. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> right. Well, and then you have like like Waymo, who's yeah. doing it as well, and doing yeah. it. That's Google. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Now, now the, the interesting thing about, about their use case that I always thought was, uh, what can you call autonomy? Yeah. Right, like what we did earlier in, in, in my, my 2017 Tesla, to someone completely foreign to it, yeah. That would seem like, yes, it's completely autonomous. Of course it is. No, uh, I you think know? Uh, it's not whether you're able to take your hands off the steering. It's whether you're able to take your mind mm. off the driving task. Yeah. That's the main autonomy. Okay, right? I got you. Right. Uh, you can take off your hands and you can travel far, right? But mm. you're still engaged. You cannot do something else. Right. 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 Uh, or safely do so, something else. So I think what you're describing would be like uh, what, what the... Uh, uh, whoever, uh, SAE or whoever makes the definition of level three autonomy, where you're still expected in case of emergency to take control and to yeah. do something, but generally speaking, you don't. You can be watching a movie or something like that, as long as you're still able to take control. Right. Right. It's not right. get back in the car and go to sleep. Right. That's right. like level four. Well, you but, know. Yeah. The, uh, I think that's level five where you don't even, I mean, steering wheel is optional. Kind yeah. Of thing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They call it four five. Yeah. Uh, you know, as in once you go to level four, the driver should never have to interfere. Yeah. And level five would be the driver cannot, as in there is no way for them to interfere. Yeah. There's no steering wheel. There's no nothing. You just, you're, you're in a pod. Right. I, I think, you know, when you when you when you narrow it down like Waymo is doing with Google, it, it, I think that's solvable, right? Yeah. When you have a, a high when first off when you have a vehicle that has lidar, yeah. high resolution data coming in, yeah. and you know fifty percent of the <laughs> machine learning experts in the world right. working there, you can accomplish this yeah. in a geofenced area. Yeah. It's when you know if we if if we were, want to fast forward to what we might call true level five autonomy without steering wheels, you know, for me, I've always said, I don't think, I don't think, I don't know if it'll, it'll ever happen in my lifetime. Yeah. Because to me, that would be, if you drop this car off in the middle of the desert in Mexico yeah. with no GPS and no internet or no nothing, right. it would find its way home. Yeah, yeah. That's because, because if you drop me off right. in the desert in Mexico in a car, I could drive around and find a road and right. then find a town and then find my way home. Right. You know, so I think that's, at least that maybe I, maybe I have an extreme version of it. Right. You know, so I, I wonder, what do you think? Like, so we have the, the autonomous lanes, autonomous buses. Yeah. I mean, like, like how long before do you complete, think? Complete it, autonomy? Yeah. I think that's uh, complete autonomy where, you know, uh, it's almost like uh, you're on your own. 20, 25 years easy. You yeah, know? It's, it's, it's crazy to even think how long it might be, right? right. And, uh, you know, but I think it will happen uh, in the lifetime of our kids for sure, right? You think uh, so? Yeah. yeah. Even in our lifetime, I think it will happen. Mm -hmm. uh, it is, uh, I, I always like to say that, you know, someday my kid will say, can you believe my dad used to drive the with car the, with his own <laughs> bare hands, you know, it's so dangerous, and they would do this, you know. Well, see, this is great because then you can you can be the hero in the right. story of how brave you were and right. how courageous. And I used to drive you to school. Oh, right. <laughs> you didn't risking just have, my life. You're risking my life every day. You every have day. it so easy. Right. <laughs> oh, man. Well, hey, Satya, thank you so much for coming, man. I really appreciate this time. Thank where you. can people find you? We've talked about your blog and stuff, but where, where do they go to find your, your information and sign up and all that? Well, so I write a blog, learnopencv.com, uh, and I'm also uh, the CEO of opencv.org, which mm -hmm. manages the OpenCV library. Okay. So, yeah, so you can reach it, me at uh, Twitter, at learnopencv, and... Uh, uh, our blog is learnopencv.com, um, and you can send me uh, an e email also okay. if you need uh, spmalik at opencv.org, and I'll uh, send you that so that you sure. can put it in. Well, thanks for watching, everyone. Yeah, we'll have links to all this down in the show notes. And again, Satya, thanks for coming, man. Always great to chat with you. Thank you so much. All right.
I hope you enjoyed that interview there with Satya Malik of OpenCV. If you want to learn more, check out the links to all the things in the show notes that he mentioned. And leave us a comment, a share, a like, a subscribe. Do all the things to let the algorithms that rule our world know this is a great podcast and that you enjoy it. So that's it for this one, guys. Thanks for watching it again, and I'll see you back here next time.